Hello, everybody, and welcome to another end of month PMP review. Why, what is the PMP? Well, of course, that is Painters Motivating Painters, our Google Plus hobby community focused on helping people take their own next step in their personal hobby journey. Uh, I'm joined for the review by uh, by my esteemed colleague, Kieran, this month. How you doing, buddy? Hey, things are good. I know you keep saying esteemed when you introduce me, but nobody else has, has ever referenced me that way, so uh, jury's you're, out on that. You're esteemed to me, sir. That's what I think. Well, that's endearing. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to go ahead and review uh, the most recent entries to the uh, the PMP. And I'm thinking I marked this as public because people are watching. <laughs> hey, like we, don't, right. we don't normally have viewers for this because uh, I download these and put them out as an end of thing. But there was some problems at the beginning with it launching. So now it's public. So, hi. There you go. We're not going to interact with anybody and this will get packed up into a video at the end. But there we are. So uh, if you're interested in joining the PMP, the link will be down in the video description when this eventually goes live, which will be in July. Uh, we're giving away some of the secret sauce here that we record part of this in the middle of the month. And uh, we will review everything. And everything in here that is tagged end of month review. Uh, so when people make pledges and then finish projects, if there is specific feedback they are looking for, uh, they post it under the tag end of month review in the PMP, and then we review it here on this video. Of course, you can also just post it under finished projects where other people in the community give feedback and all of that. And that is really the important part of uh, the PMP, which is the community feedback. This community is focused on being positive. It's focused on uh, answering questions, helping people out every single day. So we have a lot of hobby heroes in the community who are amazing at answering every question that pops up, commenting on every post. As usual, we're happy to do this, but they are the real heroes. So, Kieran, with that being said, uh, are you ready to jump in and, and take a look at these? I certainly am. Let's see right. what we're blessed with this time around. <laughs> okay. So, let me share up here. All right. Is that coming through okay? Yeah, it's fully visible. We're good. All right. So we're going to start with Dakota Weaver and his uh, mega boss. Uh, he said, you know, his feedback is welcome. He said he's a terrible painter and needs to improve. Well, that's harsh. I don't think that's true. That is. We need to knock that. We need to knock that attitude out right now. Yeah, that's not how you should think of yourself, my friend. You no, know, that's that's not fair at all. This this is not the work of a terrible painter. So let me just say that right out of the gate, okay? Um, all right, so let's talk about what we've got going on here. We've got our our, our very fun Auric Mega Boss, our Iron Jaws Mega Boss, and he's got uh, some very dark armor. We've got some nice green skin. We got some bone, etc. Now I'll start by saying you're not a terrible painter because right away the paint is applied thin and evenly. I can see that applied cleanly like there's no green getting in places where it shouldn't and black in places where it shouldn't it looks smooth and thin and well applied so right out of the gate you're hitting the basics i also like this little blood river i think that's pretty nice too um so the question then becomes how can we improve that was sort of his question so i'm going to give you a few next steps i think you can do so when we're dealing with armor like this we want to create some tonal variation get your edges uh, picked out. Like the wonderful part about this uh, Auric Iron Jaw armor is that it's got all these great edges. Pick those out. You can do that in an early stage through just like a real soft dry brush. Go look at the recent dry brushing video I put up. You can you can do it with a soft dry brush. Catch all those edges. You can work some extra shadows in here. Work some highlights down on some of the plates. All those kinds of things. I also happen to have a video on painting Iron Jaw's armor, so you can go look at that. But working in that variation, having some highlights like in places like this and catching the edges in places like this around his face to really draw attention here. Uh, catching these rivets, making sure we pull those out and make those nice and bright so that they stand out. And tonal variation is going to be the story I would challenge you with across the miniature. Um, we want to look at highlighting things back up with nice thin glazes or layers. So like popping out the face more. Let's get these eyes painted. 
Let's get some highlights here on the edges of these, you know, his eyebrows and things like that. Same with the bone. Let's get to like, we had this washed. Let's get some highlights back up on here. Let's do some thin glazes or layers back up over here. So the skin, the armor, the bone, same with down here. You'd be amazed what just a few layers of some glazed highlights will do to, to pop this miniature right up to the next level. So that's that would be my main feedback for you. All in all, you're on a good path here, man. Um, so please don't say you're a terrible painter. That's not fair at all. I don't think that's true. Uh, and, and I hope you don't feel that way. This is not the work of a terrible painter, and I'm very glad you submitted it. And I, I would love to see you... Uh, if you, I assume you're going to do more than one iron jaw. So I would love to see you work on maybe some brutes and try some of those techniques. Okay. Let's call you an improving painter. There How's you that? go. We are with, which is true for all of us. <laughs> sure is. All right. So now we've got a random mini painter who has uh, a little empire dude. All right. Mm -hmm. Hey, gentlemen. Hey, look at that. Mr. Stone Monk is with us. Well, guess what, buddy? You're going to get to go next. Awesome. I'm glad you made it out of the closet earlier this time. Yes. <laughs> uh, for those watching at home, Eric routinely gets locked in a closet by his children. And uh, sometimes on Friday nights, that game gets a little out of hand. Yeah. By the way, Eric, we have view we have live viewers this time because when I initially set this up, it messed up like three times. And apparently when it worked, it didn't set to private. So hello, live people watching. What's that will up? make no sense <laughs> when I download these and compile them into a video at the end of the month. But there you go. <laughs> Take it away, Kieran. Yeah. All right. So uh, I am quite happy with what I'm seeing out of this guy. I think the, the richness of colors and the smoothness of application, for the most part, looks really good to me. Um, trying to get yellow to, to appear rich is often a bit of a challenge, but I think that you've done that and it's been smooth as well without looking chalky. Um, sometimes a challenge with yellow. The facial expression on this guy really comes through. And you've really done a good job of highlighting the skin in the right places. Uh, when I look at the face on this front shot, for example, the bottom lip and the cheekbones underneath the eyes, uh, to me, I think are done brilliantly. Um, a nice highlight crossing over the nose as well really makes that expressive. Um, he has that little bit of a look like he's looking up at the sky, like something's going to drop on him. And he's a little bit worried, but in the pose and the positioning of this guy, it actually does seem pretty appropriate. Uh, the other thing I would like to compliment, John, if we can flip to the next frame, and this will give us a backside shot. Um, the richness of this red actually reads through really nicely as well. And you've been attentive about leaving a fair bit of shadow underneath the drape of the shoulders where that comes down. So that stayed very rich crimson and in the you know, the rolling parts of the folds of that cloak is where it really shows up nicely. Uh, also, your execution of doing that comet on the back of the cloak, as well as the golden trim that's going down the bottom of it. I think that part is executed really brilliantly as well. Um, also, I want to bring people's attention to the little bit of dusting of ground that's come up onto the bottom of his cloak. Good attention to detail on that. Uh, but... There's a cut there. I want to start here on the sword and I want to talk about things that I think can, uh, can be done to improve a little bit. So first off, you've captured the elements of sort of moving through that modulated um, silver, you know, where it, you know, it sort of goes black light and then black again and reverses on the bottom side of that. Uh, I think in the center of your highlight point, it can go a little bit brighter if you can find a way to do that. Um, I have a suspicion just through my experience and looking at the application of this that you might be used in Citadel colors on this, um, but you may have to go out and get yourself to, to push it even a little bit further beyond, I think they call it Rune Fangs. Is it Rune Fang Steel their highest highlight or Mithril or something like that? And anyway, whichever it is, um, I'm going to recommend a chrome color done by Vallejo which will actually carry you through to that highest highlight of silver. Uh, and I think that'll be a good seller on here. So when we flip to the third frame, if you would, for a second, Vince, we'll look at the, the whole armor plate as a whole. Um, actually, maybe the first frame gives us a better shot of this now that, I, now that I see it, if you don't mind going back to that one. 
Yeah. See, see, the reason I suspected you did Citadel paints is because you can see a little bit of uh, a little bit of graininess to the metal, to the metallic. And in itself, when you're doing iron armor, that's okay because it makes it look a little bit pitted and pockmarked, and that's reasonable to expect out of a you know out of a warrior's armor. Um, however, there's a few highlight points here where I think which could be caught again by that brightest of silver if you could find a chrome to do that. Uh, that would be that would be really good. Uh, the space that I think needs it the most is the right side uh, leg greave and kneecap, as well as the right side shoulder on the very top. And then you can also use it to really accentuate those gouge slashes that you've got throughout the breastplate and the, and the leg greaves too. Again, those are minor things to improve upon the metallic, but I think that it'll make that metallic, which is a big part of this model, as expressive as you've done on the face of this thing. So hopefully that gives you uh, a little bit of helpful tips of, of things to work on. Um, but otherwise, I think let's close out by reiterating again, you've done a very smooth application of both the red and the yellow, and that's the triumphs of this model. Uh, so those are the things to, to build upon for, for future. Really well done. Yeah, totally agree. All right. Eric, so you're yeah. going to get uh, the bringer of rain and his vampire, and he's asking, what can he do? To, what can he do? What can be do to get to the next level? <laughs> next level? <laughs> what what well, can be English? Yeah. <laughs> we take uh, the number 72 bus. Mm -hmm. You ride that through 32nd Street. Sure. Uh, you get off, take a left. Is that uh, how you get to the next level? But don't go into the pool hall. Um, all right. Uh, great vampire. Cool model. I've not seen this model before, so there's some. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the range or that sort of stuff. Maybe it's uh, bones or something like that. Um, what I always recommend, so next level is often looking at uh, kind of your, it can be either, you know, hey, what's another technique or what's a foundational thing that I can, can improve on. Um, and there's some, there are some uh, really good things you're doing here with your, um, uh, you know, kind of where your color's placed, going, for, you know, kind of um, alternating colors. You've got your red, then blue, then black, and then red, et cetera. Um, so there's some some really good things that you're doing there in, in, in color picking. Can you push me through the next couple of uh, images here? That's what we got. Um, yeah, so we got the, the back, and then we've got the front. Um, so the first thing I would say is uh, I think initially you've got some good blocking of of color. Um, it looks like you've got some great blending here on this flame. Um, I would really encourage you to, to try and do some of that on the other side as well. So Vince, if you could go back to the, to the first part, um, uh, I would consider blending to be a little more advanced. Um, and so here you have, I see you've got a little bit of that going on on his red cape. Um, but maybe that, that the blue could use some more of that. You, it looks like that, uh, Kind of the the blue lining, that lighter blue that just kind of goes down the inside of the coat line, um, is all just kind of one color all the way through. So I would certainly look to try and um, bring a little bit more uh, depth to that blue, and then I'm sure as well the the blue that's um, kind of the main part of the coat. And it looks like you might have that under the armpit, and then uh, kind of getting lighter up at the top. Um, so that's you know that would be the the first thing is is take some of that that blending. Um, take it to more places. Make sure sometimes if you have blending some one in in a couple places, but not in others, that stands out a bit. Um, the white on his, the white crosses on his uh, uh, inside coat stand out as well as being um, again not having a lot of tonal depth. And so uh, if you can take those and and you know the the ones that the the white that's going behind the other coat should certainly be more of a gray or a, a gray blue um, kind of behind there and then being stark white um, only on uh, kind of the topmost of his thigh. Um, and even with that, you could probably get away with doing something that's, um, you know, um, not quite white because either this guy's a little bit dirty or um, just because you, you, you want to keep it more muted Right now, even if with his face being a lighter color than everything else, those two crosses take up most of my eyesight. Uh, so, um, I, again, I think you did a really good job alternating kind of where your colors are, where you're blocking things. 
Um, but there's a couple of, you also want to pay attention to what's most prominent. Where's the eye being drawn? Um, and so when you're ready to, to, um, could you zoom in Vince? I want to see what that the face is looking like. I don't want to make a presumption on, um, so from here, because it's using, a, we're using a lot of black on the, uh, cloak and the hair. Um, right now the face doesn't look finished to me just because I'm seeing a lot of big black, the black uh, eye sockets, the black hair, et cetera. And, and um, so that would be another thing to look at. The black is, uh, am I getting any tonal depth in the black? Um, off One one w way to approach black to get started is a lot of uh, line highlighting. So you're uh, taking where all, this cloak has a lot of folds, um, and especially up here in the front, it has edges. So going along those with a um, you know, in this case, it could be a dark blue and then a light blue, not quite, uh, neither of which would be, at least the, the dark blue would not be as light as your rich royal blue. It would be something kind of a little bit darker than that. And then your bright highlight might be that highest blue that you have. Um, but that way that cloak, the folds, the shape of it starts coming out, um, et cetera. Um, but where I was getting to was that the face is is really where sh the the focal point should be, and so I don't know if that if your face is going up to a brighter white, um, if you're planning on going that direction or um, anything to that effect. But the the white on the the legs, those two crosses, are really just too strong. A way to tone those down too would be to take a wash um, or a, a you know, a glaze and kind of just start toning them down a bit, toning them into the reds maybe, or toning them into blues. Um, uh, there's a couple of options there. Um, but then even with the, the face, with the its subtleties at the moment, um, that would bring that face into as a focal point as well. Um, I don't want to overload you with too many things, but I guess that's that's where I would leave you. Um, the, the blue on his uh, inner coat, give me some more tones there. Um, the black uh, cape, give me some highlights and, and show me some definition um, in the same way that you're doing with the red, only do it with blacks and grays um, or even you know blacks and blues. Um, and then uh, those crosses on his legs, uh, those need to get toned down so that his face can, can become the focal point of the piece. Um, thanks for submitting and for the, for the you know, specific request of, of feedback. Right on. Okay. Next up. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about, let's do this. I'm going to talk about my thing real quick here. Uh, and then we can kind of jump. Caspian's got two. So uh, why don't we do this? Kieran, why don't you take the oddly sexy uh, thing from Maroc, uh, the skink. Eric, mm -hmm. you can, if you want to take the two from Caspian. And then I'll take mine first, and then I'll finish off talking about Mr. Eisenhorn here, which I would love to talk about. Does that sound fair? Yep. Okay. So let's start with this stuff. So this is uh, some pieces that I did recently, the baby Marathi and big Marathi. And um, I want to talk about just kind of how I thought about these things and th things that I ended up doing. Um, so I want to highlight kind of one technique on each of these. Um, the first on this is I want to talk about pop colors and the pop color here is quite in line, but this was originally done. The blade was originally done almost all in green and I looked at it and it felt too flat and too much like the dress. And so I went back and I grabbed some blue a very particular blue from scale 75 that I love for non-metallic metal and worked this blue as a thin glaze in here a couple times. And it changed the tint of this, of this thing, this spear to make it feel more like metal. I didn't change the fundamental colors of the thing. It was just the addition of a few glazes, but sometimes the addition of those pop colors, just some little mid-tone glaze in between your highlight and, and sort of your, your uh, upper mid-tone can make a huge difference in how we perceive the color. Um, this is a great trick for things like Nurgle, where you take yellow and blue and shift it into your gross green, and it can really change the way you perceive that green. 
So that was the first thing there. Uh, so, you know, don't be afraid to try to glaze in a secondary color. You can see I did it here as well on her spear to create the same effect. The thing I want to talk about on big on the big girl here is this effect on her belly scales, um, which was really interesting. So I'm going to experiment with this more. Um, but this was done... So if anybody's seen Pisarski's non-metallic metal style, okay, if you're familiar with what I'm talking about, um, he has a very particular hyper-realistic non-metallic metal style. And I'm absolutely fascinated by it. And I've been trying to reverse engineer it for a while. So this is an attempt to not only reverse engineer it, but to do it in unusual colors. So I'm going to play around with it more, and I'll probably do a video on it eventually once I feel like I understand it well enough to, to, to talk about it. But it's done through hashes. Um, it's a very different painting method. A lot of times when we think of painting, we think about applying colors in smooth sort of, you know, lay glares and lazes. <laughs> Layers and glazes. Ah, gla gla oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's hilarious. Anyways, um, this is done almost exclusively through tiny hash marks, like literally taking an incredibly sharp, small brush and going <laughs> like that about a thousand times. <laughs> with all these different colors over and over and over and over again, like over top of each one. And then kind of a few glazes at the end to just sort of smooth it. So it's really, it's a really interesting technique. I'm keen to play with it more, but I was, I was sort of fascinated by it. Um, that was, and so, you know, what I'll say is don't be afraid to play with stuff or to try to replicate stuff you see out there. Even if you don't get it right. I mean, this isn't right. This is nowhere near, nowhere near Pisarski's level. This is like looking at that as a distant star in space. Um, but it was still a, a great learning experience for me. Um, and I felt like I, I understood better what's going on there. So I just want to say like, don't ever be afraid to try to experiment on stuff and try to replicate things and play around with it. The worst that happens is you learn stuff. <laughs> so. Well, I'll say this definitely, that piece, that part of it definitely stood out as a new element from other stuff you've done. So, I mean, it was noticeably a new technique and I think added a lot of definition to that part of the, like, I've not held this model. I don't know how strong of a central groove that, you know, where that darkest in the middle is. I don't, is that there actually is that. in no, the that's, plastic? No, that's completely flat. Which, I mean, I, I think the addition of that is, is, is really cool and I think adds a ton of visual interest to the, to that part of it, um, uh, and it, and it was noticeable. I mean, if, as far as and and pleasing. I mean, so I think it was really cool addition and a cool thing to try. I think it paid off for sure. Cool. Yeah, it, it seemed like too much broad flat space, right? Yeah. Like, so I wanted to create that sort of up and down illusion there. So yeah. you didn't want to do tank damage. Yeah. <laughs> uh in this case it wasn't there wasn't an opportunity believe me if i can get out and start battle damaging and uh and and scratching stuff i will in a heartbeat but there was not really much opportunity this time all right so i just thought i'd share that experimentation and encourage everybody to try new stuff and you know take some big swings sometimes like that's on marathi she's the centerpiece of the whole army and i was like whatever let's perfect time to try a crazy new thing <laughs> you know so all right, let's talk about uh, Maroc's thing that makes me somehow uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know why you think that. But anyway. <laughs> lizard, lizard, lizard folk should not be this, this. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Maybe it's so, saying uh, more about you. <laughs> this, is comfortable with yourself. That, this is a piece that Maroc had done a while ago, and he did a redo of this thing and rebased it, I think. Um. And he also made mention in his comments here that he tried out the uh, the the sketch style uh, kind of painting or, or blocking in and forcing values. So from from that perspective, I think I want to say that uh, I think this turned out okay. Uh, the reason I say I think is that the photography is is a little bit overblown. Like the whites are coming in still a little bit hot in some places. Um, so we'll try to try to give you some some due criticism just the same. Um, I think on a few spots, the directional highlighting can be a little bit uh, more pronounced even, uh, but then in some places where the white is overblown, it's tougher to tell. So what I mean by that is on the feathers that are trailing off her back, 
you can see a few striations that are in there. Uh, but I think that you can actually, when you do your highlighting or, or rather your, your, your value sketching of the white, I think that you can do that a little bit more pronounced initially before you go into your jade color glaze on top of that. And then you'll see a little bit more texture within those feathers. Um, now, throughout the rest of it, uh, if we get a frontal view, just if we can go back to that one. Not her front face, but her, yeah, there we go. Now, in this one, because the O's are exposure, Myrock, this maybe looks a little bit overexposed as well. And I'm looking predominantly at her uh, at her leather jerkin, if that's what that is. Um, and the highlights, although in the right place, they read a little bit... Um, a little bit sort of grainy in this in this state and uh that probably just takes not a full strength glaze but but a softer glaze muted down a little bit to wash over those and make sure that, that smooths out um i'm guessing that perhaps that's a result of the initial spray that's still there when you're doing your your zenithal part of it and if that comes out a little bit pebbly then you have to work a little bit harder with just multiple layer levels of glazes that are very muted instead of color strength glazes to, uh, to soften that up. Um, and I've had a few cracks at this kind of value sketching thing. And, and that's my experience with it to, that I have gathered just the same. Uh, now, the other thing that's intriguing about this that I, that I think is a very cool thing to bring people's attention to is that you have what, reads as a sort of a, a light emanation from her boots and as she's striking the ground it's forcing this crystalline sort of reflection to to spill up onto her um it almost to me makes me think back to that avatar film where they're walking at night in the in the jungle and as they step on plants the plants light up um but i think it's a cool effect that you've achieved here and he's got another frame shot i think the second or third one that shows that also a little bit better for folks to see at home. So it's that ghostly emanation that comes up three quarters of the way up the boots. Um, that again, just in the same fashion as the jerkin up front, um, comes reads a little bit pebbly here. And again, it might be the overexposing of the of the photography, but, uh, but that comes through okay. The last thing I want to talk about uh, with this model is how metallics like the true metallics that you used here reacts with this value sketching and uh in most cases it doesn't really uh, uh well I, I shouldn't say entirely it, do, it, it does give you some kind of value of where to put your initial highlights but you still have to add a little bit more interest in reflection when you're doing the metallics rather than just letting the value sketch of white and black distinguish that for you so i think the way that i would read it here is in the crown of her helm that reads really really light i think that you need to force a few more dark spaces in there where the texture changes um and what i mean by that is just on the inside of those sort of jade insets that are above her eyes i think that's a place where you need to force a little bit more darkness and get closer to the the kind of tone that you've got underneath the tines that are emanating from her crown. If, uh, if that makes sense, my anatomy of a helmet of a skink priestess helmet. Um, yeah. So I think that's something to, to work on is, is forcing the darks in the, in those metallics on the gold. Um, and then just maybe again, another pass of very, very lucid light glazing, to, to soften up some of the, the pebbliness that appears on these guys. But uh, yeah, I'm glad to see you. Vince and I, even before we launched the broadcast, we're talking a little bit about going back to old models and, and redoing a little bit. So I'm glad that you're doing some of that to step Absolutely. up and improve and try new things. Yeah. All right. We got two from Caspian. We've got uh, an elf druid right, where Caspian says he tried some NMM that he's not satisfied with. And then we've got uh, Marathi. Why don't we start with the Druid and some non-metallic metal?
Mr. Stone Monk, are you there? Are you talking on mute? No, I just had to switch my mic real quick. Sorry. You're okay. All right. Um, let's see here. Why don't you uh, push me through a couple of these uh, images? Let's see what we got. Um, I think so. The ph the photography is, uh, I think, you know, using this white background, uh, I know not everybody loves it. Uh, I think it, it's fine. I think in general, you'll probably got um, good lighting. Um, you could probably, I don't know, I always bump up my exposure on my phone a little bit when I'm posting pics just to pop out some of the detail, um, see where things are at. Um, I don't know that I am the strongest here of the three of us on non-metallic metals. However, um, uh, what I know is that non-metallic metal is, has to do with, uh, you know, creating values, um, in the, in the, with the color in such a way that it shows reflection, that it shows, um, highlights within kind of a smaller context, right? It's not, it's showing a greater, um, variety of reflection or, or, uh, here, even in this, it's it's very easy to tell that I don't know uh, non-metallic metal as well. Um, and I think right now, I've, uh, the photography is kind of hurting my ability to kind of give you good good advice. Um, do you I'm want seeing, me to do you want me to jump in and, and say a few things? Yeah, why don't you if you can if you can tell from this some things to to give you, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll address the the NMM. I don't want to I don't want to steal your thunder. I'll address the NMM and then give it back over to you for the rest of the feedback. Okay, so let's talk about NMM. And here's the first question I have for you. Um, why NMM? Are you doing it because it's just a good chance to play and learn a technique like I mentioned earlier? If so, I support it 100%. Keep doing it, keep trying it, way to go, way to be. That's, that's painting bravely. If you're doing it because you feel like you have to for some reason, don't ever feel like you have to. There's, no, there's nothing innately better about non-metallic metal versus regular uh, true metallic metal. So I just, I want to make sure that you're, you're going down this, you know, complicated road for the right reason. And NMM is much, much, much more difficult than, than normal metals. So yes, NMM is capturing the effect of, uh, all the reflections of metal in scale. So you need to have very good control of your light points, etc. And like, we'll take this shoulder pad, for example, it's, it's very hard on squidgy figs like this. Because like, and what I mean by that is like, this is not a sharp fig with a lot of detail. But let's take the shoulder pad. Okay, so what we would need is we would need extremely sharp edge white highlights that are very clean and crisp. We would need white light to come. This is like a column or a, a, a cylinder. So light's going to reflect down it right here. Okay, so there's going to be a light line traveling down the high point. Like... You need to know, you need to understand like how light works given the shape of the surface in NMM. And um, actually a shout out to Cujo Miniature Painting who has a wonderful walkthrough on the different surfaces and how light acts on them. But long story short on this one in particular, there should be a light line coming down the center point here within soft highlights at the edge here. And this should be the darkest part. And you need to go way down and come way up. Like that is to say extremely dark up in here and up in here toward the top as light cascades down, collects here and then on the top edges alone here and here. Same thing here. This should be the darkest surrounded by edge highlights of white. And then this should be sort of a mid-tone with a very dark thing surrounding it. When it comes to color recipes, I mean, there's a million that work. I You can do NMM out of just about any color combination as long as it's sort of getting at the idea of the thing. Um, but my general advice would be, would be like pick more straightforward surfaces. This is actually a really wonky surface to try NMM on just because it's so weirdly shaped. If you want to learn NMM, get some regular swords, just like, like literally like swords, double-sided swords um, that like you see every night in, in, in games carry and practice on that. T have them tilt at different angles and see where your light points catch. Flat surfaces like swords are very easy to practice your blends on. They have very direct and straightforward edge highlights. They have very sort of set highlight points. Like you saw the Empire uh, General earlier that we looked at in this video. 
that was a great placement of light points. They needed to be popped up a little more. That was that was TMM, but it doesn't matter. The same rules apply, right? So that would be my basic instruction. All right, back to you, sir. I think that was the the main focus of uh, the request. I think um, the only other things I would uh, kind of uh, encourage, it, and, and I think a lot of the encouragement that came from the the community were things about this face. Um, if you go to, um, you can see a picture of. There you go. Um, even though we can't, we don't see the face uh, uh, directly. So that would just be taking a picture from a lower angle, so we can see some of those. It does look like there's a lot of character there, and you've you've added a lot of character with the uh, eyes, etc. Um, I would say, be, given the color choices, the greens and the browns feel like they kind of muddy and muddy together um, uh, in this photo. And so, what I would really suggest would be one: make sure that your blocked colors are really strong. Again, if you if you're going with a green make sure the tone is maybe a little bit lighter than the brown or, or um, yeah, that the shade is a little bit brighter so that it has a, has more contrast between the brown and the green. Um, and that you're kind of alternating where you can from a green, then a brown, then a green. And it blocks up the space really well. Um, and then, um, you know, I like what it, if you've got a shade over it, that's going to be fine. And it's going to get into those recesses and again, separate out those things again. And then uh, you have opportunity to highlight. Uh, so around her collar uh, would be a great opportunity to highlight with a brighter green, especially down uh, kind of towards the middle uh, on the chest, uh, and even to a yellow in some places, uh, in into the brightest places, again, so that you're, you could be framing her face and, and bringing attention to the center of the model. Um, and you know maybe, again, on the, the belts that are going around her uh, upper waist, above her, you know, around her rib cage, you know, you could get a highlight on those that would separate it from that brown as well, but maybe not go as high up into a yellow um, or a, a, you know, yellow green. Um, the other thing that would do too, given your basing, your, your foliage, which is also a very bright green, that would uh, tie her clothing into her surroundings a little bit more. Um, her surroundings uh, seem to be a lot of, in this case, a lot of prairie or at least a lot of, you know, uh, green, vibrant grass and stuff. So that'd be that would be some uh, advice there. The the blocking and highlights. Um, now again, you've you've done such good work on the face, and that's the focal point. I think there's maybe a, a tough part of this sculpt with the why is the face looking down um, uh, when it's such a characterful face. Um, but the hair and the that top knot are kind of very prominent. There's something that you see, and so. Um, maybe take a challenge you to, to do a little um, highlighting on the hair, um, getting it, uh, you know, bright highlights using the very sharp tip of the brush. You can't really do edge highlights on that. You maybe could, but it probably, those, those little ridges are probably a little too light for that. Um, so trying with a very sharp uh, point to your brush, uh, making some of those, those hatches or, or really quick uh, moves, um, but keeping them don't, don't draw them from the base of the knot to the forehead. Um, just keep those drawn uh, kind of towards the top of the hair in between those so that they end up kind of fading um, towards the knot and towards the forehead a little bit. Um, I like the kind of coloring on the staff that either the sculpt or your painting has given that really nice kind of wood feel to it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that that's, there's a couple of spots like that weapon on her on her kind of front the legs um could probably be i think it's in a metallic but maybe go with a, a silver uh the gold kind of uh, is maybe too brown and gets a little lost here um and if you um I'm trying to look at the the side view as well so and, and it also matches with the if the armor is also silver on her arm uh, that would make sense as well. Um, for the little Groot guy, um, I think you've got some really good things going there. Again, the same foliage. I would take his the his uh, kind of leafy, leafy head and go a little bit brighter with that green so it kind of fits as he's a part of the surrounding, etc. Um, and maybe some variation in his uh, in his bark. So 
where he's uh his the core of the trunk might be brown maybe it hit it you could use dry brushing and vince mentions his dry brushing tutorial a little bit earlier um dry brush some green um around towards the hands so the hands look like they're the newest sprouting space you know that's where the the new growth will happen etc or those little shoulder leaves etc so those would be a couple of tips for kind of taking these guys uh bringing I know that the non-metallic metal is something you're working on, which is great. Um, those would be a couple of other things that, again, utilize some of the same um, principles of contrast, highlight, um, uh, but not in a shiny way, just in a um, you know visual interest in design sort of way. So All those right. would be my thoughts. Yeah, good thoughts. Let's talk about Marathi, the big girl. This, this is also you. Ah, <laughs> sorry. Same guy. Same guy. Let me you got see. a twofer here because you, you were late. Twofer. Sorry. That's your, that's your punishment. All right. So I'm seeing a lot of close-ups. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I really like the color choices on the top. I really like the white dress. I like the purple skin. I like going into a lighter um, hair. I'm not, I'm seeing a lot of uh, varied uh, close-ups, but nothing really close-up of her torso. Um, so the first thing I would say, I think it's, is it picture three that gives us the most uh, wide open view of her? I think so, yeah. This one I'm on, I believe so. Yeah. Um, so we've got uh, the blue, the purple, green, gray, or, or silver, and white. I think these colors work fairly well together. Um, the purple and green are often uh, good complementary um, and uh, or, or good not complementary, but they, they work well together and then uh, fitting into the blue. Um, here's another place though where I would say that her dress being so white and this uh, I, the advice I gave on the vampire one as well um, that dress because it's white ends up kind of drawing the eye more than the character's face and because the character's face is such a dark the dark purple it's also darker than the blues it's also darker than uh the gold on her forehead and the silver in her um, crown and so her face is is really the darkest part of the model um uh, sans the the base or the um that kind of folded wing section in her, in her arm um and so that's where i would probably uh, suggest focusing on blending that up to something brighter. So whether that um, goes from a purple up to a lavender in that space. And then I would, I would certainly um, look at toning down the dress, it may be, maybe making it more the gray color similar to the silver um, so that it kind of becomes a mid-tone and that lavender can, can, can be that high tone. Um, I really like, I mean, your membrane work, you know, getting your darks and lights. There's some really good stuff going there. There's really good, um, you know, the the part of her her tail that starts wrapping around that pillar um, gets brighter in that section. And I think that's good, um, you know, again, being able to travel around the model. You've got the big wing. You've got her face you want to focus on. And then you want to focus down around the tail and wrapping around that pillar. And I think it's good to have that that tail be um, brighter and a little bit more of a focal point. Um, and, uh, and I think um, your, so your overall kind of just tone setting is good in a lot of places. I think the, the contrast between the dress and the face need to be flipped. Um, and, and that, that will, I think you're going to enjoy that a lot more too, with that face being more prominent. And then that's going to also let you get in there with details um, play with her eyes, uh, you know, her her lips color, her, you know, uh, cheekbones, you know, all that kind of stuff. With this dark purple, you're really, you don't have as, uh, you don't have as many options going to light purples or, you know, getting into more warmth. So even if you're using a, um, a Caucasian flesh tone or even, a, you know, a darker a brown uh, flesh tone, there you get a lot, you'll get some more warmth or some more opportunity to play with some different colors, even having purple as a base to those other things. Um, so those are, those would be some, some things to think about. Um, the rest of these shots, uh, the, if we 
go a little bit further to the next one. <coughs> Let's go one more. Uh, the back again. Uh, so I would say the... I don't know. I, I like dark bases. I like especially, you know, to let the let the um, the model on top pop a bit. Um, but there's a few things that are hard to read because the base is so dark and maybe it's the photography, but but so I would find some some points of interest on the base to kind of brighten up and to give us some clues on maybe it's her just her tail in certain spots gets a little bit brighter again. Um, around that flame or you know at other points just so that again we're moving around the model it, it takes our eyes and it travels around um etc any thoughts from you guys on this uh this butte no nothing else to add it's good stuff it's a big model it's a big challenge i know <laughs> yeah yeah i want to tack on two real quick things and that is eric i think you're exactly spot on that moving into caucasian flesh tones and blending that and mixing it with your purple actually does do a whole lot more. Don't go into white when you're when you're highlighting with purple. Go into the flesh tones is my best advice. And uh, the other thing on the front side of the model when you're doing those armor plates that go down her her frontal snake, you started into doing some of that uh, picking out of the brocade and the carving that's on those things. Uh, don't be shy about it. Follow that through but you may have to get a little bit of flow aid so that it's not spilling up on the armor plate when you're trying to actually get that paint to flow down in the carved bits. Back to the front shot. Yeah, that's you see what I mean there? It mm -hmm. spills over a little bit, and it seems like you stopped a little bit short. Uh, you only did like six or seven armor plates on there, but do them all. It'll, it'll look good. Yep. All right. So next up, we have Eisenhorn uh, from Alan Thomas. All right. Let's take a look at this guy. Great model. I was happy to see. He said he's looking for general painting direction, something to focus on the next hero model, gray facts with paint cleanliness and transition, how to weather cloaks away from the base bottom edge, only in the higher light portions where it bends in the light, smaller long cuts, highlight color, etc. cetera. Um, okay. So let's talk about... Uh, Let's talk about what we can do here. All right, we have our pictures are somewhat small and I cannot zoom in. So this is going to be what it is, people. Okay, so stuff that I see out of this picture. Let me wonder if I can, wonder if I can just make it bigger like this. Aha, problem solved. Okay, <laughs> stuff that I see. Let's talk about where we can go. Um, so I'm going to give you some quick general advice kind of in line with what you're saying. Uh, the Reaper high densities will work fine. Make sure you also have flow aid. If you're going to do sharp, thin lines, any of those high density paints alone will fail you. If you try to do them straight out of the pot, you need probably some ink and probably some flow aid. That'll get it flowing. Um, stuff I like in this model. Colors well executed. Red looks, the crimson, I should say, looks really, really rich. Green looks rich. It's a wonderful capture of Eisenhorn of this guy. Like he reads as him. You have delivered this model well. Paint job is very clean, precise. I like it. Um, now, where we have opportunities for improvement is around things like the metals. Um, and I know you said you're transitioning to the Vallejos. That's good. We also then want to transition into the into shading these. Like, let's take this the Imperial sigil on his chest here. Um, it's very flat. What we want to see is some really dark sections in here and some high highlights where we pop out this thing because it's quite detailed um, with the little skull and the wings and this, that all that all those things have names. I don't remember what they're called, but etc. Same with the underside of this uh, skull, this thing, yeah, and this thing. Like we want to have, you know, some shade and some highlights pushed into here. Now, you had mentioned about the cloak, so let's talk about the cloak. Okay. Well, we have two different things. Do you want to show texture or do you want to show weather? Weathering, what we do is we take some kind of basically pigment, whatever world he's living in. It seems like it's a pretty dark mud world. And so we would do some dark pigment, like dark brown pigment and fix it. And then probably some very light brown pigment um, above that or, you know, the reverse order. You could do the light brown all over first and then put the dark brown pigment on and then fix it. So it looks like the bottom of the cloak has been more exposed to mud that has seeped up over time and dried. 
and you would kind of stipple it with an old rough brush roughly up from the bottom and you'd want to do it on both this and the underside that way it looks like it's dragged along in the mud which it certainly looks like this thing would like it's flaring right now but clearly he's wearing a very long cape that would oftentimes scrape in the mud um now when you're talking about highlights and texture if you're looking to capture fabric texture then yes like in general at the highlight points or not exactly highlights but close to you want to think it more of like your near mids you have to get an extremely sharp brush get an extremely well flowing paint and basically what you're going to do is freehand a ton of little lines like extremely thin and uncomfortably close like all in here and all in here and down in here and so all that stuff and you're just going to do it over everywhere the only places it's not going to show as much is you can do some across the highlights depending on how high you go. Um, highlights would tend to not show the texture because they would tend to become pure light. You don't need to show it in the deepest shadows either, like up here and stuff, because in the deep shadow, the shadow is going to hide the texture. So where you really want to focus it is in the mid layers. And oftentimes the easiest way to do it is just do it with a near white paint of some kind. Um, white gray if I was doing this green and then glaze back over it in this green color to bring it all into into to snap it all into focus okay so those are my thoughts overall um it's really well done i want to make one final note i love the flesh tone on the face it has these nice red tones in his cheeks i think that looks really good you want to make sure the lips are a little darker in like not in the lips themselves but in the line that separates them this should be a deeper shadow we also want to make sure we have dark lines going around his eyes like his eyes look too big Right now, we need shadow. We need a deeper shadow around the eyes um, to, to make sure they're more segmented from the rest of the face. Okay. All right. And I thought, gentlemen, that to, to end our current review, whoa. Now we gotta go back to normal. Dude, there we go. We're gonna do a jumbo sized? <laughs> yeah, indeed. I thought we'd all talk about ca uh, casinos here together, okay? Mm hmm um and so he said he decided to go with a not very realistic color scheme use blue shadow to make the red orange osl pop more and all this kind of stuff so which is a great idea by the way cold shadows against warm highlights is a it's classic blue on orange all right so i thought we'd all just kind of take a look at this together and make some commentary on it sure. and then we'll close yeah, we it a couple up things to say then. hit me you go well first of all i, I want to compliment you on the boldness of the idea I, I have seen this kind of thing done in other places in the past and it really is an attractive look to get that hot and cold going on in the same model and uh and i and i appreciate that you've leaned into it i would even encourage you to lean into it a little bit more so what i mean by that is that you've done the flesh tone and then picked out highlight spots that are going to be orange you know commensurate and, and reflective of the uh, of the, the flaming sword that he's got in his, his, in his hand. I think that immediately my first thought is uh, carry over a little bit of that orange tone into your helmet and, uh, and that reflective stuff. Uh, it, it can be a little bit more orange than yellow there to make the distinction because otherwise it just sits and it reads as gold that's not quite reflecting all that heat that's coming from it. So I, I see that you have done some highlighting and you've picked it out in a little bit of yellow and you've gone as far as yellow with it. But I think if you stay a little bit more orange, um, then that'll read a little bit better. Uh, now my other comment was going to be about the blue and it's better exposed and, and talked about when we look at the backside of the model. And again, I like that you've really leaned into it here. And I also want to point out to, to the watchers at home that the skin and the flesh tone that's going down that left guy's side doesn't capture all of the orangeness that the other side did, right? Which is exactly the right thing to do. But I think what you can do to level this off overall, my initial thought is that that blue actually in some places appears to be... Um, I'm trying to trying to think about the it's 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 a value it's the, it's the hue itself of the blue that comes in a little bit too strong. Yeah, it's too uh, saturated. Yeah, is that is that the word I'm looking for? I don't. Know. Yeah, you have a very saturated blue, right? A true blue. 
Like it yeah. doesn't have a lot of tint or shade to it. So it's right in that true blue high saturation midpoint, which would be okay for a few parts of like the highest shadow, but those mm -hmm. deepest shadows should look much more, you know, navy, right? Much deeper, more purple tone into them. Right. And, and that's and that was my instinct to go with it or move. Maybe it has to be muted a little bit more with a, with some more neutral color that's going in there. Um, and, and maybe you can pick it pick it up from there, Vince. Then and talk talk a little bit about the the saturation and hue change. Yeah. So I mean, because and we have very fairly hard lines too, right? Like here and stuff like this. Like this just becomes very blue. What I think we would want to see here, like I love this idea, and I think the execution is actually quite nice. I think what we, we would want to see is this should look much more down in here should look much more purple uh, blue. So like all these deep shadows here and especially as we get out here and get as we go away from the flame, the shadows should neutralize as well. Like you neutralize the heat, neutralize the shadows, right? That is to say, like they shouldn't if you're trying to get the hot, cold contrast, which is cool. This here, here, all this stuff over here. This should be way more purple toned, way more of a normal shadow because it's not hard reflecting this. And then I would push these more toward the purple here and here in the deepest spots. And then on these edges, I'd smooth them out. You want to like, you want to glaze some of your brown back in, get these smoothed out a little bit so that so the light transition looks a little softer. Um, that's sort of the initial thing that that popped out of me. I I love the cold shadow idea. I think it's a fantastic touch, and I think it's largely well done your blue tone is just a little too blue uh abba di abba die so um what my my advice would be yeah to, to sort of neutralize this out i want to make one other if i can just keep going for a second i want to touch on one other thing light bounces okay and this is silver so this is flaming and it's shining down here what part of this silver gauntlet should look orange this is a test for the other two. Uh, or are you, quizzing, are you quizzing Eric and I? Uh, yes, I'm quizzing the two of you. <laughs> Say it again. So cool. light bounces. This is a big giant flaming sword that would yeah. be broadcasting light all over, right? It'd be traveling in lines out from here. Mm -hmm. What yeah. part of this gauntlet should look orange? Inside. Inside of the wrist and, uh, and right at the fist would be the places I'd put it. Exactly. So a little bit here where it's traveled over and we've got some hitting this edge. Cause this is highly reflective silver is how he's painted this, right? So like, even though this isn't carrying over and he's largely in the way, ambient light is bouncing all over this, this room, right? If you've ever turned on a highly yellow light in a room, it doesn't, you know what I mean? It's gonna bounce all over the place. So this should be weak and this should be a deep orange reflection, very subtly glazed in down here. Cause what's gonna happen is the sword's gonna go, light beams are gonna go whoop, and come down here, hit the ground, and go boing, and bounce right back up into here, right? And that's the th that's the sort of thing. Like when you're really selling NMM, you've got to think about not only where the light is directly shining, but where is it reflecting from. Commensurately, you nailed the shadows on the skin here, being super deep on this side, really well, which is good. Most people miss the deeper shadows. You nailed it, but it should also be here. Should be a, a slightly deeper shadow also and here in the gold like this side of his face here and here should be also commensurately darker like these would be an extremely deep shadow given what you've told me is the the value on the skin but yeah this is great stuff yeah like, leaning into it a little bit more is, is the overall you know shadow the shadow versus the heat yeah my thing i think for me it would be yeah, definitely the his so our right side, the beast's left side, I would darken that up. I wouldn't have as much warm flesh tone in that far shoulder um and far arm. Um I would I would take you know, like you said, lean into it, but not just like the muscles have a light warm side and a dark side. The whole model should have a warm side and a cold side. Mm -hmm. um and so a couple of glazes so you've got the warmth showing in the skin tone on that on our right side the model's left side i think some blue glazes would start toning that down um and it wouldn't it wouldn't take all the warmth out of it like one of the things I, i'm amazed at seeing painters 
who can make something look like a human with flesh tones, but there's not an orange in it. It's all greens, right? Right. Like there's ways of making, you know, make it just fool in the mind into reading something as flesh tone when it has no natural colors of, of the flesh in it. Um, and so I think you could glaze this down, um, that, that right side down, um, to just almost make that again, that, that, that this to the left is all warm and to the right is all cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so that would be my thoughts. Yeah. Good stuff. More. All right. Yeah, this is, it's great stuff. Want to see some more. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end for our mid month and, take uh, Take a pause. We'll go, you know, get cleaned up. I can't lie now because people know we did this one in the middle. Oh, man. I can't do my funny joke. But uh, you won't <laughs> see this go get posted because it'll go private after it goes up. But you will see it back in July when it gets paired with the other half of the review. So we'll see you back then. Bye-bye. Well, we're back. It, 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 it seems like only a moment ago that we were here and reviewing miniatures. Kieran is back. We, we lost Stone Monk. He got lost in the coffee shop. So maybe he'll join us at some point. But Kieran's here. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, still still with it. There's much more to look at in this glorious month. There is indeed. So are you ready to just jump right back into this madness? Yep. Let's see All it. right. So we've got a lot of hotness here. And boy, oh boy, do we have a fun thing to start on which is Sawyer, okay, our, our probably our youngest regularly submitting member, uh, has finished up Mortarian. Uh, and this is a big mini. This guy is a heck of a project, obviously the Primarch of the Death Guard. And uh, so we can see here, again, Sawyer is nine. Can we all just he's, admire? He's doing all right. He's doing Okay. Like, Sawyer, buddy, you're doing an awesome job. Um, by the way, that's not for a nine-year-old. I didn't add that on there. You're doing an awesome job. Full stop. Okay? Um, yeah, like, I love the colors here. I love the ways applied them. Like, the smoke and mist, I think, especially, look really nice. I love this white to blue as a contrast. Um, the wings look really nice. Little yellow pustules, the dark edges. Um, I really want to call attention to this nice, very light rust effect here around, I don't remember what this, his scythe is called. Is that Mortarian scythe has some name, but probably death something. And uh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm guessing here. Uh, that looks really well applied. And the wash and stuff, like the dark areas on the gold all looks really well applied. Like you got nice shadows cleaving around all the areas here. Then he went in and re-highlighted stuff. So it looks real good. You're taking the time. He's even got the little yellow-black bumblebee tubes here, you know, in the arms and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, looks real good. Yeah, that extra detail brings forward a lot of flavor. That's for sure. Um, and the other thing that strikes me here is the color spectrum that he's gone through. I mean, the central part of this model starts out in a very deep purple and plum color. And I do kind of like how it sort of has fingers of that color that reach out. So not only does it have it draping down the robes that come on either side of his armor, but it reaches up into the framework of the wings as well. So purposeful, I'm sure that, that Sawyer is even at the point where he's thinking about color balance and, and composition when he does models like this. So that certainly strikes home that he's pulling that together. Uh, we've talked a little bit in the past, I remember with Sawyer, about doing some some bone color and and making sure that that moves through. So he's got a couple of bone spikes on that left shoulder that I think have, have turned out pretty nicely. Um, I think one sh one last sharp edging is going to finally get to that place where it's, uh, where it's pretty near perfection, Sawyer, from where you're at right now. So that I noticed. The other thing I, that caught my eye on this is he did some, some real cool basing material and has like little bubbling pools down there mm -hmm. as Nurgle enjoys. So Nurgle nice. loves a bubbling pool. Yeah. Yeah. And a few spotty colors of other floaty bits in that bile of goo as well. 
Um, so that, that plays off nicely against his brass that he's easing up above. Um, that's the one thing that's tough for me to tell and give him a critique upon is that brass because of the way the photography is coming in. It just kind of, you know, makes it all look super shiny. Um, so it's tough to read into that, whether there should be more shadow, etc. So we'll save that for some other shots, maybe. Um, look at it again. Yeah, let's scroll through here and look at the rest. Here we can see the back. Yeah. Good darkening on the end of the his uh, plasma pistol there. Yeah, looks mm -hmm. great. I think my one challenge I'd give you, Sawyer, is here when it comes to things like the armor, on focusing some of your shadows around some of the very hidden darker parts, like here under his foot, bottom of his knee, you know, up under these plates down here on the bottom of his shoulder. Focus on working some shade down in here. Like take some light um, agrax or something and just do some very light applications of it down in these areas. That could be a nice, easy way to even pop this out some more. Yeah, he's got a couple of pools of brown that he's got into those pock marks. Mm -hmm. uh, and that works. But, but yeah, I think I agree with you that that could certainly be a... It's not the highlights that you need help on. It's the shadows in that case. I agree. Yep. But good stuff, man. I, it's a you know, huge project. Yeah, let's finish off by saying that uh, I thought I saw here that he submitted this to a local store painting competition and came away with the prize. Oh, that's awesome. That right? Uh, I don't know. Let's find out. I think it's in the entry. Yeah, let me look back here. Uh, it doesn't say it here. Maybe. Oh, said he was about to submit it. We don't know what the result. Okay. Was. Well, I hope I hope that uh, you you uh, you did well. But even if not, you should feel extremely proud, Sawyer, because this is great work. Many, 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 much more senior people don't ever finish this model and don't ever finish it looking near this good. But you put in the work and you should feel proud. That's what's important. All right. Yeah, it's a big triumph. It really is. Can't wait to see what you do next, buddy. Keep them coming. Okay. So next up, Paul Stockley has some brutes for us. I know these guys well. Oh, you brutes. And so he's done some nice freehand patterns. Let's actually start here on the back. He says this is, you know, the first time he's done a lot of this. Um, you know, large amount of skin, leather, pan uh, leather pants, black leather, sketch style pre-highlighting, uh, and then freehand on the armor. Okay. And he says right now he just didn't have a base for them because he needed basing materials. So that's fair enough. The model itself is done. So let's talk about the... Uh, these guys first of all the undershading is working great like i can see the highlight you look at the richness of the variation in the red and the green it's wonderful i dig it yeah we see this face you got some nice pinky tones worked in around the lips and the nose i dig the heck out of that uh that's looking great there we go that's a good shot see the pink around there you can see the nice gray of this steel and then we've worked in some uh, some rust and orange color. That looks quite good. Okay. Picked out all our rivets. Rivets. Got some nice mottled leather. That also looks solid. Yeah. So uh, all this looks quite good, man. I'll tell you right now. For like for a unit, I you know, your freehand looks good. Um, if you want to do some some fun things here, it looks like I think what you were trying to do with this stuff here was have it be um you were trying to replicate like the armor or the the freehand getting scratched like this white paint being scratched off so i'll give you a, a piece of advice because it didn't quite work like i get what you're going for but it didn't quite come out so here's what you want to do with that and it's kind of counterintuitive when you're putting it over white like this you need to mix a darker red than your normal red because when you put your actual red back over top of this, it's not going to be the same as the color underneath. It's going to get real bright because you're putting it over dead white. Okay. So you want to mix something darker and you want to get a really, really sharp brush and you want to just push in very slightly. Like some of these are too big. If you're going for like tears, then you want to like push in from the edge and then stipple around it. Like you want to push in a spot and then just chunk up the edge with this very sharp brush. You want to do like little, very thin slices from the edge. 
Um, as opposed to looking like this looks spotty, like you kind of stippled at it. And the problem with that is you're not covering enough to actually look like it worn through. So one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is to do the scratching. It's actually kind of a two-part process. You can do the light scratches in with just like a darker red than this. And then go tss, 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 very light touches, very light, thin touches. If you want to do a big chunk, you come in, you paint like the circle, and then you chew the edge out. In like think of a star pattern or something like think of a bullet hole in a wall that's what you want to make the outer pattern look like and uh then you come back in with some white and you dot inside a little bit and connect it up so it looks like little bits of the white paint are still hanging on that's how you can sell that effect um the other the only other thing i'd say is you may want to think about with um With uh, some of your highlights on your armor, you may want to think about popping them a little bit at some high points. So you can go back over with kind of a white here and here, you know, maybe on the tops, the shoulders here around the face. Just a couple more bright edges to kind of pop those out. Just a little more um, could be a good idea for you. It'll just help. Set and I think you're good to go. But, you know, overall, these look really great for a unit, man. It's, it's good stuff. And I think his green... Orc tone turned out really vibrant. Yeah, uh, I agree. Man, York bad. skin looks strong. I like it a lot. I love the addition of all the orange and, you know, vague rusty red, brown and orange in this sort of gray steel. That looks really good. Adds a nice color to what would otherwise be flat. It's really popping it up there, that richness. Okay, now it's time for some spooky ghosts. One of what I suspect is going to be many spooky ghosts over the next couple months. Well, yeah, in July, I'm sure that we'll see bajillions. Mm -hmm. But Alex was getting out ahead of the ahead of the pack here on these ones. Um, and uh, what he said in his commentary here is he wanted to talk about doing the blends and the, and the fade into the ghostly trailings. Uh, so obviously that's what we should be talking about with these ghosts, starting from dark on top and, and fading through light at the bottom. His next frame is actually better to look at because he gives us a side glance of it. And you can see that he's moving through black into a sort of a midnight blue and then into green and finally uh, a turquoise and white at the bottom. Um, my first impression of the way that that blend goes is I think that, you know, at this, at this distance, it looks fine. Uh, there's, there's not too many hard lines. Uh, except for the one where you finally, where you go from the midnight blue into green immediately. Below that line though, below that horizon, I think the, the smoothness is, is pretty fine. I think that looks good. But here's the thing that I think I might have you think about if you're doing more of these things, which you probably will obviously in the future, is it doesn't have to be a band at the same level all the way across. So if you could see what I'm doing with my fingers right now, Alex, you would see that I'm kind of doing a, a, a sort of a fingers um, filtering into one another kind of a look. And what I mean by that is I think some of your green can come up in fingers a little bit higher and, and so that you have not a straight band across where it goes blue to green, but it's sort of waving up and down a little bit. There you go. Thanks for the cursor visuals. That's, that helps. <laughs> Um, because you do have that going on where it trails away into the white at the bottom. And I think that's more convincing. So, so think about that when you do the next batch of it. Um, and then I also think you could actually go with a little bit more white. I know that it gets a little bit chalky when you get down to the very bottom of it, but you have to go a little bit thinner, but I think you can get a little bit more of it, um, because it frames the ghost against the base a little bit, a little bit better if you have some more white down to that. Um, similarly on the scythe, I think as you come to the top of the, of the scythe, you can extend the lightness of that just a little bit more too. There's another space that I'd like to see that. And then it'll frame the model top to bottom um, in, a, in a much more dramatic way, I would think. Now, the other thing I wanted to quickly talk about on here is this uh, red band that goes around his cowl. Um, so I get it that you want to do a little bit of spot color, but I think that against the 
colors that you've chosen for the rest of it, that just comes in a little bit hot. Um, it's not that you've actually used a terribly bright color, but because it's so starkly against opposite things on your color wheel, it actually stands out more than it should. So there's a couple solutions to that. One is that you would have to tone that down and, and stay in the very, very dark spectrum of, of red, um, like into crimson or a very gore red to do that. And then you could even sort of do something similar as you trail away down the side and fade that into, uh, into something more ghostly as it trails away. If you want to try to do that kind of red into green blend, which is maybe tougher, but, um, but it's a thought to think about. The alternate that you might have, and I'm less, uh, I'm less convinced of this, but I'll say it anyway, is that the, the, on the bottom of your scythe, if you could get a little bit more red into that corrosion as well, then it could help to balance that off and make it look not so bold in the very center of it. Um, and you can still do all this while still sort of framing the face in the central point of your model, which is always what you want to do. You want people to look at the, at the face of a model first. So it'll still do that, even with you toning that stuff down. So, so there's a few things to think about as you go forward and painting many, many night haunts. Right on. Okay. And there we go. All righty. So, and I apologize. I called him Alex, but uh, Alan, apologies. Alan. <laughs> no problem. All right. So why don't we do this? Uh, why don't, uh, next up, if you'd like to, if you want to keep rolling, if you want to roll right into this Tam the Third's uh, Lord Relictor here, and then mm -hmm. I will take uh, Fulcrum's uh, Bounty Hunter, okay? Um, his Necromunda conversion, because I'm all about the Necromunda Escher uh, gang, so I will I would love to jump on that. And then we can both circle back and uh, take Mickey's here. How's that sound? Yeah, okay, well, let's load this up. And look uh, now. We're on the, on the white stuff in here. We're a little bit so assault because like photography over long. But I think if we look at this thing overall, um, composition wise, let's start from there. Looks great. Um, you have red in a few different places, uh, balancing out against blue in a few different spots. Um, so, so that's fine. Uh, the rest of it is pretty much all metallics and, and a bit of neutral colors. So that works okay for me. Um, let's talk about the, uh, let's talk about the gold initially though. I think that I can see that you've done that sort of swapping over of facets to, uh, to show that reflection and to show the depth of, of color within that. Um, I think that the darks can still go darker though, Tam when you're doing this kind of thing. Um, your placement actually looks pretty good, how it's shifting from one facet to the next. Um, is there some, does he give us one tighter shot here? Gold, yeah, this one up here. So this is what I mean. So at the root of these spikes that are coming around here, you can see that it's very much darker than on the, on the flip side of the facet. Um, and that to me is the right placement of things. Um, in some of those other spots, it's kind of lost. I think it's there. Like you can tell that it's there, but it's not dark enough to, to really be, to really be bold from a distance. When we look at the framing around his head as well, lower on the screen, uh, you can see that the instincts are still similar, how he's doing the lower half of the facet in dark and then the flip side and the tips in gold. Um, yeah. So overall, just uh, your, your darks need to be, just significantly darker to really sell that dramatic, uh, that dramatic gold. Uh, the rest of the way, again, I think that all this bone stuff um, might be a little bit brighter than it than it could be. Um, tough to say, again, because I think the photography is betraying it there. Um, the other thing I like is 
this blue is actually very rich. Uh, and you've done a good job of doing the highlight blends in that without there looking like there's any kind of stark lines of contrast. Uh, so I think that was managed really nicely with your brushwork. Uh, and, and overall, I think that the, the again, the composition is, is really well done. If there's any extra thing that I can say about composition that you might have tried is, is there another spot on that banner up top that we could have done a spot of blue um, to, to bring, to bring you up to the top with that. And maybe it's, maybe it's glowing eyes is probably, or, or the pommel of the sword, perhaps. Is that a, take, take a closer look at that. Vince, what do you think? Where would be a spot you might put some? Yeah. So if I was going to put some blue up top, yeah. I mean, there's probably like a, this guy's wearing a circlet. That circlet could be blue. There's stuff in here. This could be blue, the cross guard, the gem on mm -hmm. this. Like it can all be whatever you want. Right. Cause it's just a relic. Like, so who, who knows? Right. All of it could be blue in, in some way. I do like that he's brought the edges in, into the blue up here. Like, that was a nice addition, right? He's got yeah. this this thing edged in it. I think the problem is it's not quite strong enough. Like, he's got the right idea. I think he saw it too, right? And said, okay, I need to get some more blue up here. And so went for the edge. And that's that's a good instinct. In the end, I just don't think it was strong enough to to truly balance it out. But it's he's, he's you know, on the right page, right? Yeah. Um, in closing, back to the metallics for a second, I want to say that the silver does have exactly the right kind of contrast, and it does look bold enough. Like, you look at that sword that's being held by the relic. That's great, right? Um, yeah, it's just the gold that needs it a little bit more in the shadow. So that's my my main closing thought for you, Tam, on, uh, on working on these guys in the future. Right on. Looks good. He said he's got more Stormcast coming. Well, we look forward to seeing it. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, oh, next one. Sorry, here we go. All right. Um, so this is Sabine, the leader of his unique all girls pirate gang for Necromunda, um, inspired by Sabine Wren in Rebels. Uh, very cool. Um, so let's take a look at this. This is a, a wonderful conversion of a, a model that I'm a big fan of. Um, so things I, I really, really like about this, and there's a lot, okay? Um, first off, very nice uh, execution of the plasma weapon here. Let's just talk about that at the beginning. Um, wonderful hot spots, wonderful transition of your value tones around that. That looks fantastic. Um, same with the sort of lightning on the pseudo power sword here. You got a nice white hot spots. Traveling through the blue spectrum, those all look really good. Uh, next thing I want to comment that I think looks wonderful is your freehand, like on the helmet. Um, it's great. Uh, it's a very sharp, well-executed design. Um, I'd love to know where you got this helmet from. The Because it's a good-looking helmet. Uh, but j just wonderful execution of that sort of Mandalorian-style you know, helmet and freehand and everything. Same with the mark on the chest and the checkerboard pattern here. All the little touches of freehand look really good. Okay. Uh, so a couple areas where we could um, improve or where we could sort of take the step up to the next level. My first thought is I'd love to see a little, the skin is really nice. You have good shading. It's very soft, very supple. I'd love to see a little bit of pink or red tones worked in here slightly, especially around the spots where it's meeting the joints here and here, up here and here. There's just a few spots of skin, but bringing in some blood, some life into that, I feel would add a lot. Very subtle, very soft. Um, I think it would also help actually frame and push some more red around since you've got it here and here. It's kind of very centered right now. By pushing it out into the arms, you would expand the red a little bit off the pure vertical line. You would create more of a, the diamond to it and stretch it, which will make it, it'll be more of a warm area in the middle completely, uh, You, which you're bounded by cold right now because you have blue, blue, blue. Um, it would help expand that red. The second thing I would say is on the edge of this cloak here, I'd love to see it pop just a little bit more right down here, here at the light catches, pushing up the highlight just slightly, um, maybe like, you know, a gradient, maybe two. And then finally on the pants, 
Um, it's a small area of pants. I'd love to see some more shading down in this area here, up here where it's being hidden kind of by your gun. And at this side, like, assumingly the light is coming down like this. That's what your, that's what your shading is telling me, that it's about at this angle. Um, so given that, it would strike here and here. Right, and this would be more in shadow, and this would be more in shadow. So a little bit stronger shadow there, or maybe even some texture. We could play with uh, you know, some slight scratches texturing something like that on the pants, something to make them more visually interesting. Because the challenge I have right now is that they're quite flat compared to the rest of the model, which has a lot going on. Like when we look at the rest of the model, you have supple shading on the skin, you have freehand on the armor, you've got energy over here, and then we get to the pants and like pff, khaki. And that's it. So a little bit more sort of excitement in that area and visual interest, I think, could really go a long way. Um, that being said, I mean, this is a wonderfully clean execution of this. Like, it's absolutely a stunner, man. I love it. It's great. All right. Yeah, taking away that uh, power sword execution with the lightning crackle through there. That's it, obviously the first thing that caught my eye. Yeah, it's it's really good. Um, I love the extra, you know, a lot of people when they do plasma weapons, I've seen a lot of people do, obviously, the coils and even the lights in sort of the barrel. But I don't see many people do the tip, right? Like where he's got the hotness here. Mm -hmm. I quite like that. I don't think I've ever thought of plasma weapons like that. I've never thought of actually heating the tip up like that to show the plasma kind of coalescing. I'm going to steal that. I dig that. It's kind of actually a nice balance on the gun itself. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So next up, we've got Mickey, who's doing her diorama. I believe this will be for, um, this will be the eventual base for Marathi, because it's a little stone statue. Um, so her questions are, do the petrified people work? And if not, what does she need to change? Is the balance across the scene right? Uh, and if there are dead patches, what does she need to do to correct them? Are there any other Easter eggs that would be good? And most important, is there anything wrong? Okay, so let's take a look. Obviously, I think it's supposed to be Marathi because, you know, Marathi turns people to stone because she is like a Medusa. Yeah, makes sense. Well, she's got all kinds of little interesting things going on in here, uh, like these mushroom caps underneath the tree, uh, various snakes, which will go along with the Marathi Medusa theme, obviously, is what she's leaning into there. Mm -hmm. So those are all good touches. Um Little things like collections of skulls of obviously past victims is selling me the idea that this is not a safe place to be. And Mickey always lavishes her basing pieces with a whole myriad of different kind of vegetation from creeping plants to uh, spurts of reeds and tufts of grass, etc. Um, she's always, I've always appreciated how she's paid attention to the nature that's in nature and what i mean by that is greens and browns that sort of grow into one another um, that are often overlooked even in stone right like her stone is has got that coloration in it the tree yeah. arc is turning green in places because of the moss gathering etc um and that's being pulled up onto these figures as well like we can see that there's a lot of green that's coming up onto that. And I think that's a good touch to sell us the idea that these things have been there for a long time. Um, the other subtlety that I picked up here, Mickey, that I think is good is that because of the dusting that you've done, uh, I assume it's at the airbrush level on this, that, that still also sells the idea of petrified stone on these things. And I'm looking at the hair of these uh, of these elves, for example, where you can see that it's speckled. I think that's a good touch. Yep. I um, assume that's going to be looking up. This will be basically our angle where we're looking up at Marathi, looking down at them. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's, that's an important angle to consider it from, right? Because sort of if that's where she's facing, to be facing these three figures who are turned to stone... This is obviously going to be sort of the direction people would be looking at it, right? Yeah, that makes sense. So the thing that I'm going to be curious about when this comes together is we have a couple of hot spots of orange that are within those, uh, those mushrooms and the snakes. So I can only assume that that's going to appear 
on Marathi herself. Um, and if it doesn't, then that's the one thing that I would suggest is that we got to find another spot for that orange to appear in this environment as well. Up on the tree branches or higher up on the model. Yeah, I think overall, um, overall, I agree. I think that it's well balanced. I love the green tones. The rocks look natural. The water looks natural. The vineage feels like it could use something. I'm not sure if this was like this vineage here was painted. Uh, it feels like it might be just the vine, like the actual flocking stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I think you could go a little ways with adding some washes around on this, maybe working in some brown tones through some shades or something on this stuff. Um, just to get it to make it feel more like the, the, the texture of the piece. It stands out right now is my concern, right? Like look at the green and the freshness on this compared to all this other stuff, which is painted, right? Um, Cause everything else has such rich tones and color changes and complexity. Um, so, but I like all the stone. I like the, the sort of duct work buried under there, the crackles, the earthy colors, the snakes, the cross hatching on the, the burlap. Here's one thing that's, that's tripping me. The new wood. Like this is the old bark and this is the new wood, right? I'm not sure if these two should have this color palette. Like, if this should be darker than this. I don't know. Something about it does this feel off slightly. I can't put my finger on it. Um, I'm not sure whether this should have a newer wood tone. And this should have a few darker spots in it with some more gray since it's like old shedding bark. Or whether this is the fresh and alive part. But something about the color difference here doesn't quite check for me. Um, it's a minor knit. It's just what kind of jumped out at me. Um, now, as to the execution on things like the snakes. By the way, are these the snakes from the old snake swarm from the, the Lizardman snake swarm? This it feels are. like they are. Yeah, okay. I thought so. Um, good repurposing there. Uh, so, you know, everything else I like. Like, the scene looks good. They're all The figures are all pointing up at the direction. Like, again, I can tell where Marathi's going to be, even though she's not on here. <laughs> right? So, like, that tells me you're communicating effectively uh, what's going on here. Um, so, all that works. I like the leaves in the pond, the subtle greens in the pond, the running water. Like, that is all A-plus stuff. I have no issue with any of that. That's all exactly executed correctly. So, yeah. I think, overall, you're in a very good place. Look at this. Re-look at this wood situation here and tell me if you think you feel that really looks how it is. Something about especially this tone. She doesn't sit right with me. The brownness of it. Um, for the wood separated with the bark over it. If I, I, Maybe there's a picture in nature you're referencing that I'm not thinking of, but this feels too chestnut compared to this is like sandy khaki color. I'm too red. Yeah, exactly. In the red direction. Yeah. yeah. So, I don't know, but there you go. That's my thoughts. Anything, uh, anything else you want to add before we jump away? No, I think that uh, obviously all these things are very elaborate and uh, and going to create a great composition. Uh, when it all comes together with the with the focal point on it, then then we'll have a different take on it. Yep, we'll look forward to that in a couple months. All right. So let's see. Next up, we got Tom Philbrick with his Repercon twenty sixteen Sophie, and then we have Christopher Miller with uh, a wonderful Joan of Arc Infinity miniature. I guess an alternate Joan of Arc. Um, let's see. Would you like to take Sophie and I'll take Joan? Yeah, sure thing. All right. I have this figure. It's a fun figure. Uh, for Reaper, is that what she is? Yeah, she was the ReaperCon exclusive figure from 2016. Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, every, everything about this looks looks kind of cool. Raising the dead. Um, so, 
So composition. Oh, Kieran, I think we're losing you there. Position wise, everything is. Uh, uh, oh, could be. I'm so sorry. Come back. Nope, you were still choppy. Okay. Keep trying. Oh, there you go. Hold on. Go ahead and talk for a minute. Well, the one, the thing that I want to talk about on this lady is the robes. There you go. You're okay now. And, uh, and the darkness that he's that he's trying to get with this thing. Um, I think what Tom's done is he's done just sort of an overall general general highlight uh, without doing any kind of particular um, hot spot of light, for example. So that means that the places that catch the most light are across her lap uh, and her, and it would be her shoulders, right? So those are the two points. He's, he's captured that just fine. Uh, although I would say something about it has come across a little bit grainy here, Tom. Um, and I don't know if that is a function of the model itself. Um, these are, these are metal cast models, aren't they? Yes, it similar. is. Yeah, it's metal. Yep, it's metal. Yeah, so there might be a bit of pock marking going on in there, but I just there's a few spots when you look real close at it that it comes in a little bit chalky in some places. So a little bit of glazing over that might uh, might reinforce it. Um, coming in with some absolute black in some places, um, you could reinforce a bit of a more depth in the folds and stuff like that, but. We've always said here on this program that doing white and doing black are the two absolutely hardest things you can possibly do in painting um, because they're at the end of the color spectrum. There's no, there's often no room for wiggle and no room to work. Um, so that's a small thing about that that I would say. Uh, the other thing that I have a little bit of a desire for is a little bit more color shifting in her wings so that the folds within her wings are are a deeper tone. Um, there's some natural shadow that's coming from your photography in the upper part, but I, but I feel as it trails away to the bottom that we lose a little bit of that. Um, but those are my two fixer things. Let's, uh, let's end on the positive though. This face on Sophie is so very expressive, the way that you've done this. Uh, it's so very important to do the eyes as you have, and they're staring straight at you in this, in this way, in this photograph, um, so that the user who's watching this is looking straight into Sophie's eyes. Um, and then you pick up on the big bright smile, your shading underneath the cheeks really, really shapes that well. And there's good color in there. Uh, you haven't gone over the top with the, uh, with the bottom lip, you've done the right amount of, of sort of redness in that. Uh, and I also want to say that the color tone of the hair is really rich and the catching of the highlights in the places that you put it on there is very convincing to me as well. So, so I think that's the winning point of this. And that's obviously the most important point of it, Tom. So I want to make sure that we end on that, on that compliment that that's, that's very well done. Yeah. Yep. Totally agree. All right. It's just a fun fig. Like, she's got such a great attitude, and I feel like Tom really captured that well, right? Like, the mini itself has a great sort of... You get the emotional sense from it, and I feel like he brought that out. All right. So, uh, this is... Um, he says that, you know, help it, uh, that uh, squeezing an hour of painting in every day has helped him. That's good. It's the right way to go. Paint a little bit every day. So let's take a look at uh, the alternate Joan of Arc here. Uh, gorgeous model, obviously. Uh, so first of all, what do I like about this model? Pretty much everything. Let's just start there. Um, I like most everything of what you're doing here. Okay. Uh, the hair is rich, wonderful execution on blonde hair. You'll notice there is no yellow in that, or at least not as we would think of it. One of the classic problem or mistakes people often make with yellow or with uh, blonde hair is mm -hmm. using yellow in it. We have avoided that handily. Um, similarly, the red is nice and rich. The freehand is well executed across 
the uh, across the the model. That is to say, we've got these little lines on her shoulder pad and here on her uh, tabard or whatever it would be. Um, all all very well executed. The um, the armor itself and the plates, your edging is pretty nice and sharp. Everything is well called out. Uh, so overall, I think where we've got some opportunities to improve here, okay, is, and this is already really good work. I would just want to start by reinforcing that, right? Like this is good stuff. Um, you're, 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 you're doing good, good things here. Okay. So where would we go if we want to improve? If we want to take another step. So the things that jump out at me are the following. Um, first off, the highlight points could have could go just a bit hotter. Um, so points where you want to do light catches, like the top here, here, the edge of her. This, this is like this down the center here would be a serious light catch. Down here, sort of at the top of this ridge, really making sure you strike a nice hard white there can really can really pop that reflection out. To the same point, having a few darker darks, really pushing it here. And here, like we're relying on natural shadow a little here, but pushing it even farther down here at the bottom of this plate and so on could really help. Much like you've done down here with the red. Like, look at, you've really shadowed this red strongly, and I love it. I'd love to see that same depth of color and transition up here in her armor, uh, you know, where we're moving that far, especially as well in the patches of gray where I don't see it as much, right? Like some of the gray here that we've got, it's a little flatter. We don't move through any transition on it. And I'd really love to see us, us do that. Um, at the same time, the black and gray itself is where we've probably got the most opportunity. So here where he's reaching this, I don't remember what these aliens are called, but the bad guy here, where he's reaching his arm up and then here on the gun is where we kind of see it. And the gray isn't quite as sharp as we might want. Um, you know, it's rather stark in its transitions where we have them and the lines are a little thick. Whenever we're edging like this with gray on black, we want to make sure that we come back in. If we want to do really sharp edges, the key is you come back in with the black and you're going to trace right around that. You're just going to push black up like this is my brush and I'm just going to push it up and just really get it in there and then push it up and stuff like that. So you just get these ultra thin razor lines. Right, and that can help sell the illusion of what you're what you're aiming at there. Um, same on her gun, right? Um, that she's got over here. Um, speaking of the gun, this yellow thing probably shouldn't be here. Um, this is way too. None of this is yellow, as I said. This is what's good. Like your highlights on the hair is again so wonderful. Um, same with the skin tone, by the way. Really well handled. I can see the the rosiness in the cheeks, the lips, all of that. That looks nice. But then I got this big yellow thing on top of the gun i don't i don't know what it is but it's very distracting like the rest of this when i cover that up my eye moves around the miniature so much easier um, because we have this wonderful flow of red going across the miniature this direction and we have you know this brighter color of blue trait taking me this direction right so that's a wonderful x pattern and then i've got this yellow that's just like look at me and uh, I don't want to look at you, bit of yellow. So this should either be the same blue as her armor or just black like the rest of the gun or red like him or something. Any other thing that's already in this, this image would be great. Um, but yeah, overall, that's that would be my feedback for it. This is absolutely wonderful work. And I really want to thank you for sharing it with us, Chris. It looks great. Yep, I gotta agree with that. Yeah, armor, armor colors and shifting on air was really good. It really is very smooth. With so many armor plates and panels to deal with, that can easily get lost. Oh yeah, very easily get lost. Oh yeah. Um. So let's do this. Uh, you just mentioned the Fat Boys before this. Uh, before this, before we started. So would you like to take uh, the ogres here? And uh, I'll take our, our duel, even though it's got, it's half Nurgle. I can handle half Nurgle. 
And then I thought it'd be fun for us to, to review Scott's together because there's a lot to look at with Scott's and talk about. And so it's a, a very interesting, unique piece. I thought it'd be fun to review that together. Sound like a plan? Let's do it. All right. So we'll start with the fat boys. All right. So David. Nope. You're silent I, again. I feel like he has done before. Yeah, he's done stuff like this before. But it's been a long time since we've seen anything from him. Is that right? Uh, yes, I yeah, think so. Good. Yeah. It is. You're better okay. now. So what I, what I thought was unique about his style of, of painting in the past was he's really pushing the cold ice... Uh, business because he brings it into the tusks of these uh, tuskers as well as the horns out the back but also brings it into the exposed flesh where it's sort of the mange is showing through um, give me the next frame I think we get a side shot of that and that's kind of where I want to talk about the flesh on these tuskers themselves yeah and even in the so the other thing about the blueness of this is he brings it into the flesh of the tusker itself. You can see, you know, around the muzzle and, and above the eyebrow. I think that's great how he's sort of brought a little bit of flesh into that to give it some kind of color, but it doesn't appear too warm comparatively to the rest of it. Now, when we look front to back on the fur of these things though, that's where I think I would like to see some variation. Like most convincing representations of animal fur in our world has a lot of variation in color within it um, on, on wolves for example you'll go through you know white through gray through brown and, and black and have that all in there even though from a distance it, it might just look gray to you but uh, but there's often a little bit of brown in there you can try to do some cooler browns and i think the place to do it is on the crest of these things like when you want on the top side and maybe a little bit on the shoulders and back on the haunches um, Experiment with that. See if you like it. Um, it can be done even on these things at this point by getting in there with some brown washes and doing a little bit of a subtle touch um, so that the fur that's raised up is still going to be this sort of pale gray. Um, and it'll read as that from a distance for the for the watcher. But uh, but working in some, some brown, I think, will, will add some depth to that. Um, Let's uh, get another snapshot. We can go ahead. And, uh, and maybe one more, actually. I want to get a, one where we look tighter on the, on the ogre itself. So the flesh on the ogre, on the contrary, this is a very warm, warm flesh tone. And I can really appreciate, even from a distance, that you've worked some purple into there as well. Um, I think there is actually you know, flipping it and kind, of, and kind of bringing the balance the other way. There's opportunity to add a little bit of blue to that. Um, not on the raised top of the shoulder, but when we get into the belly and underneath the shadow of the helmet, that's a place that you can work in a little bit of blue. Again, uh, this is done with just very light glazing. You'll have to really dilute your material that you're putting onto there. Um, but that'll add some extra richness to the to the flesh tone from what I can see here. Uh, and then my final thought that I want to leave you with is sharpening the edges on your metallic. Uh, I think that the light catches obviously a few spots on this helmet, but when we look at the side view of the blades of your weapons and that kind of thing, I think that there's some opportunity to catch some really sharp light points on there to get some more richness into the metallics as well. Um, but before closing out again, I want to say, I really appreciate how you've worked in that sort of cold feeling of flesh on these Tuskers. I think that's the winning point on these things. And, uh, and that's brilliantly done. Um, so that's why I feel like a little bit of carryover onto the flesh of the ogres themselves doesn't counterbalance you so far to a warm side of color temperature. So, so do think about that when you do, you're doing your next ones, but, uh, but keep going on uh, an otherwise good looking group of fatties. 
Absolutely. All right. So next up, you know, I think a couple people, this must have been a thing. I don't have a GW store, so I didn't know this is going on, but apparently this is going on. And I guess the stores had like a dual competition because this isn't the only one of these we've got this month, by the by. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see another one here in a, here in a little while. Um, so this is really interesting. I love because like dual is one of, I think, the neatest categories that like GW is one of the only companies I know that really does this as like a category. Um, classically in Golden Demon, they've always had a dual category. So I love the idea of stores doing this as well because I think it is a really fun sort of, you know, thought experiment, right, to, to, to play in this space and have to frame, like, two figures in, in battle. Uh, all right, so let's take a look at how this has uh, come out. And, you know, my initial thought is um, the painting itself is quite good. Um, I'm trying to get a nice... There we go. That's the shot I wanted. Okay. So the painting itself is quite nice. We can look at sort of the execution here and what we see is very cleanly applied paints, nice sharp colors, stuff like that. So um, everything looks good in that regard. Um, where I think we've got some opportunity here is probably in actual uh, like color choice. And what I mean by that is, so when you're framing a duel, the two dual com contenders need to be obviously opposed. And one of the ways you sort of do that is with your color choices. And I think, you know, we have a Celestial Vindicators uh, guy here. So we got the sort of turquoise and gold, and that's fine. Um, my challenge is that this uh, Griff Charger is in similar greens to the pus coil and that's strange right like you don't want to share a color across two characters in the duel i know that sounds weird but you don't want them to both be have like major portions of the same color because the problem is three of these things look like they belong on one side of the duel now like coming into this fresh he looks like he belongs with this guy and this dude's alone Right. So what might have framed this better is if we had sort of a light blue skin here, like maybe a blue white to a dark blue feather or maybe like some blue and gray or something like that. Or whatever. There's lots of different choices we could do. It doesn't have to be this, like and it wouldn't have to be the same colors as armor. Just kind of moving along the same things. Or if we wanted to have a green, have it be an extremely light white minty green or something like that in the feathers with like very white pale just hint of green skin right and then what we would have had is two figures that were much more diametrically opposed and framed against each other so that's sort of the first thing i noticed there it jumped out at me from a distance um the now as do the sort of taste the rain rainbow nature of this um because you're using like all the colors there is blue here and orange and green and we got pink you know purple um it's it's we, we we're bringing it all in um it's fine i'm not immediately opposed to that in any way but you want to make sure that you know they're more segmented like again we've got this purple passing into pink tone over here and then we're using the same thing over here on the bird right whereas like if we had focused more over here on a set of colors and here on a set of colors it makes them feel distinct okay so i know those are general compositional elements um but i think those things are really important for kind of setting the actual stage in a duel it's one of the most important elements of it is making sure that the duel comes off as being framed properly and you can see when you pull back to this distance shot see how the green really leans this way we have too much green it's too heavy in that color um now as for the painting uh you know to talk about just a quickly a few things i like the stripes across the cloak though you want to make sure that the black still has a little bit of highlights within it um like on the back we don't want it to be super black it should still have some of the gray spots here just very much lighter touches 
on the edge of the fur. Um, the some of the transitions were, you know, the same thing I said about edge highlighting before is true here. You'll see that previous comment about working it down and sharpening it up. Um, and then there was a few transitions in here that you may want to look at glazing a little more. Um, some of the things on like the boils and stuff like that, but you know, it, it's minimal. That's it's pretty minimal. Um, the only other element that jumped out at me um, was the uh, was the sort of bones on the, or I shouldn't say bones, horns. They're made of bone on the uh, Griff Charger. Didn't seem to have any real strong transition, whereas you did have a stronger transition here. I think you could even push it more. That'd be another fun way to show opposition. You could have these horns be much more bright and white and ending in subtle red browns and have this horn be, you know, sort of like an ivoryish down here and going very quickly into brown and tipped in black. So this one would naturally look rotten and sick and these would naturally look healthy and growing, right? Little stuff like that helps set the scene of the duel apart. Okay. But uh, yeah, overall, very cool, man. Like, uh, you know, the colors are bright. They're very well executed. You have very clean application. So I think this is cool stuff. I dig it. Hope that, uh, hope that gave you some more thoughts. Something else I noticed about that, his, uh, his base is done with a, uh, with a hot wire cutter to get the foam to, to chop you up that way. Okay. Um, but I'm afraid there's a few spaces where that still kind of shines through a little bit and looks a little bit unrealistic. So on some spots, I can see that you've added texture, um, like you've done that at Grelin Earth on the top surface and added various other things. I think you just need to hide that a little bit better. Layer on some more stuff is the answer to that. You know, get some dirt on there, get some sand and some grit. Um, go a little more heavily with that Agrell and Earth stuff so you can get some cracked earth. Um, and I think that will feel a little more realistic in your base structure too. So, yes, I just wanted to add that before we leave it. No, I dig it. All right. So Scott Palmer brings us uh, Fujin from Rising Sun. And this is a very interesting piece. As he came in and, you know, he had, he had gotten some advice in the middle. And so let's see where I ended up, because there's there's a lot to look at here. Um, so let's just take a moment and sort of take this all in. And, mm -hmm. you know, let's take a moment to observe, like, the color transitions on the robe here, this layered, very dynamic robe that's kind of, you know, flying all around. And uh, the freehand flowers and such, right? All of this. Okay. Yeah, when I saw this from the backside, I couldn't really understand what was going on at first when I looked at it. Because <laughs> there is a lot of billowing going on there. There's so it much like, billowing. It feels like he's trying to, like, keep his tent from blowing away. <laughs> <laughs> it does a little. <laughs> that also has three sleeping bags in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a strange miniature in, in all this extra motion. Um, okay. So I also love the, the texturing and cross pattern hash hashing, whatever you want to say on the, the burlap. That's looking yeah. great, man. Like, you know what I want to say about that actually is how he has kept it so very uniform throughout. Yep. Like that's so difficult to do when you're doing those fine lines and striations. Cause I've done it before and to keep them as equidistant as he has, throughout this uh, is actually a huge challenge for him to do. So I give him full compliments for that, first off. I, I completely agree. The, the second thing that I'm attracted to besides all the other robe work that we're going to talk about is his life that he's put into the flesh tone here. Like there's a couple of spots that maybe I think that the highlight has come in a bit hot. But I do appreciate how he's worked red into the uh, the depths of it to do his shading for this and really define all the shape of this model that way, uh, especially around the face. So that's a good win as well. Yeah, I agree. You know, 
So I, I very quickly want to get out the... I'm just going to jump to the, the part of this that I think doesn't work. Okay? Um, and then, then we can go on from there. It's the bass. Mm -hmm. Now, I love a big bass. Okay? You know I love rocking a big bass, man. So I am a big proponent of that. But there's an easy rule with the bass. The bass can't be... The thing that the fig is standing on can't be bigger than the, the figure. Because if it is, especially on a small bass, it looks out of place. But there's two challenges here. I want to go back to this picture. Like, I want to jump out of the picture. What do you see from this distance? Well, I see a big jutting piece of yellow rock and some shape on top of it that I have to look a whole lot closer and find out what it is. Exactly. There's a piece of green in the middle, but that yellow becomes so overwhelming, right? So again, I, I've mentioned before, yellow has the highest luminosity of any color. It always shows the brightest. And what you've got on that wood is effectively a yellow tone, meaning it overwhelms everything else in the piece because it is so bright and it just consumes the model. And the problem is it's similar in color to the burlap. So it's very difficult to tell this from this at a distance, right? Whereas if this guy was just on like a dark gray rock or something over a, fro a frothy sea, it would stand out so much more. This piece is a problem. The figure itself isn't. It's this. Get rid of this thing and you take this guy up like multiple levels just immediately without literally putting a brush to a paint to, to the model. Okay. It's too absorbing and too eye catching by a long shot. Um, you know, I, I, you were going for epicness. You saw, I like, I can see that in your head, you have this model bracing itself against the, the wind and you wanted this giant sort of sweeping rock. To, to really capture the epic level of the, the miniature. The problem is it ended up doing the opposite. It's so big, it diminished the miniature. And that's not what we want, right? We want, we want this guy to sing out. So he needs to overwhelm whatever he's standing on. If you're not going to do a true diorama, and then, then we'd have different rules to apply. Um, so that's just a, a quick thought for you. It was the first thing that jumped out at me when I was looking at this piece from a distance, okay? So... Um, now, that out of the way and having been said, um, the I, I like all of the color and application here, um, though I wonder, let me go around to this side, I wonder why this, like this seems to be some tied up thing he's holding, right? But why did we make this cloth the same brown Again, like look at this model from right here. Look at, literally look at what I'm looking at. I have no color in this picture from this angle. Right? None of note. There's a tiny bit of red. There's a tiny bit of red. There's a tiny bit of green. This is brown. From this side of the model, it is just flat brown. We don't want an angle like that. So like this feels like more of his robe. And it feels like if that part was, was, colored and bright it would help this stand out even more from whatever he's meant to be holding here this giant i think i feel like he's a carrying a area rug um <laughs> but like it would just pop in so much more and i think in a previous version you had this thing colored and i, I think we kind of talked back and forth about it and i was you know like i think whatever the color was i talked about some other options I think bringing it into line with everything else, we just have too much of that same stuff going on here. We got this area of incredible, incredible skill and beautiful interest in the middle. Like this part of the miniature is just stunning. I mean, it is gorgeous, man. And then it's let down by this area. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my overall thought. Uh, yeah. And, and you hit on the one thing that I was just going to say is that that feels like 
that rising cape should continue to be an extension of the color splash that he's got in the central part. Yeah, exactly. So that's our thoughts, man. I, I don't know. Did you have anything else you want to touch on? I mean, overall, it's it's great work. I'll tell you right now. I don't know how sold you are to this base. You know, if you if you're interested, I would take it off this base and build it a newer, smaller base. I think you'll love it a lot more. Personal feeling, you do you as always. Um, but I think, uh, but I think that uh, if this guy were on just to be like a rock on the sea. I think he would he would just immediately improve a tremendous amount. So personal feeling. Yep, yeah, I'm with you on that. Okay, but great stuff, man. I definitely want to see more, Scott. All right. <clears throat> okay, next up, let's see. We have Justin G. Um, he's looking for a review and guidance on his color choices and placement. He started a word bearers force for heresy. Um, so why don't I take this one? Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to take uh, Tebow. Look at that. He gave me pronunciation help. Yay. Okay. If you want to take Tebow's typhus. Yeah. We'll do that. All right. So um, Justin says he's, uh, my goals were to have a dark earthy scheme based on whole red and scarlet red, not to look like Christmas Marines. <laughs> okay. Questions. Do the colors work well together? Do they draw your eyes where they're supposed to go? And should I incorporate other colors? Okay. So we got some red and green, which yes, always does bring the chance of, of, uh, it's Christmas time in the chaos warp. Um, and grandfather Nurgle has brought gifts for all the, all the good boys and girls, of the world. No, I mean, the word bearers aren't them. I know. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to get hay mail for confusing chaos factions. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, let's, let's talk about what works here and what doesn't. So does the, does the red and green work? I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, I actually don't have a problem with the red and green here. And you avoided the Christmas problem actually in a very good way by using not, a you know, an evergreen green, right? Christmas green is traditionally very, uh, rich, dark green. And you're not doing that, right? Um, you went with a very deep, you know, crimson red, as we talked about in the beginning. And then you took the green into a more escorpina, you know, sort of uh, vibrant yellow green. Perfect. No issue with that. Um, so I think that's good. Um, now, as far as like, so general color scheme and color choices. Yeah, I think you're fine. Um. I think you could probably get a little more like on this guy. He needs some kind of green over here on this side. Like I know there's nothing in his hand, put magic in his hand, have it be glowing right here. Like this dude's got glowing magic -y crap out of his hand. This Terminator dude, just put it in his hand too. make the interior of his hand glow green. Why not? He's summoning magic. You know, he doesn't need a physical ball magic. It can just be energy and that can balance that out. Um, <clears throat> my other thought is you may want to like the model itself is betraying you here a little because it's fine cast and it's tough to work with but you may want to look at Juana trying to sharpen up some of the edges so what I would do with that is I'd get a nice ivory color and I'd, I'd edge almost everything here in red and then I'd go over it with that crimson a nice glaze of that crimson you've got some edges but they're just not quite popping enough okay um the gold, I feel like if the the gold here and stuff needs a little more work, it feels a little rough. I feel like we want to really kind of bring that out a little more. Um, as to the texts and the writing, yeah, that's all fine. I have no issue with that. Um, when it comes to this guy's magic, we probably want to focus like the color transition is nice, but again, it doesn't need to be so vertical and smooth. We can still vary it, right? We can uh alter it up a little here like this has nice ridges those could take a wonderful dry brush and you could use the edges of the ridges to bring some of the lighter color up into the top here and then have the face of the magic also be like lit so around his eyes this like pseudo spiritual blood letters eyes he could have some some bright spots here in his mouth and maybe the 
you know, something like that. Maybe even the tips of his horns, whatever. I think that would also be a good way to go. Um, so yeah, beyond that, uh, I think probably with your bases are the last thing to jump out at me. Um, they look a little flat, um, especially you've got a lot of nice colors up here. And then we've just kind of got this brown mud and the, it's like brown red mud, which is fairly close to the Marines itself. Um, I feel like this needs a little more, like maybe some dry brushes and a wash, maybe a little bit of gray worked in or some flesh tone worked in like dry brush or flesh tone and then wash over it with something or, or something like that. Maybe a dry brush of a uh, sort of mid-tone gray, something to make the earth feel separate from them. Because they're so red and it's so red, they kind of conflate right now. That's my only thought. But overall, very cool. And uh, glad you're posting again, man. Welcome back. Cool submissions. I love seeing Chaos chaos Space Marines. With with a green flame, too. That's yeah. Good like touch. Jeff Egan is, is happy because Escorpina is on the table. I can, I can hear him <laughs> being thrilled from here. Okay. Tebow, I'm gonna. Yeah, I, I couldn't be happier that now I know how to say his name. All right. <laughs> well, you, if you were if you were steeped in in French language skills, you would have had that right away. I am not. I am far from steeped in that. That is for sure. <laughs> anyway, you, this is all Nurgle events, but I think you're gonna like it. It's not. It's not horrible pussy Nurgle. No, it's, it's not. This is the Nurgle that I like. Nurgle it's Space the Marines cool, are decayed Nurgle. Yeah, Nurgle Space Marines are good. This guy's, and I like what I see here. Spoiler. <laughs> yeah, Go this ahead. is uh, this is a tremendous piece of work. So let's let's get that off my chest right now. In in a whole lot of ways, um, as we spin through just some photos in general, I want people to pay attention to all of the extra stuff that he has lavished this armor with. Um, the cracks are not naturally there. He's painted all those on, and this is a lesson for everybody to pick up on. Whenever you do these fine level cracks. It has both a deep and a highlight, right? Because the light is going to catch on the top edges of those things. Uh, the other thing that I'm so envious of is his management of this steel. Um, it appears in some ways a bright, shiny steel that you might not expect on a Nurgle piece, but it's not overstated. Like he's really trying to stay dark with his steel and catch those light points. And he's done a good job of paying attention to the directionality of light and making sure that he stays along the proper conjecture with it. The other thing that I super appreciate as well, we can see it on this front shot on whatever that sort of power coupling is um, on top of the scythe. But he also repeats it in a few places like the, the fly on the top of his shoulder or at the base of the axe as well that he's worked in a little bit of a red in there to make you sell the idea that it's copper. And then he's got a little bit of blue to give that verdigree in there. Um, that's the, the one spot, although I appreciate the execution of it, I think that to sell it as copper, a little bit more of that red would actually, and, and a tiny touch less of the blue is uh, would, would sell it even better. Not, not that it's bad. Like, please don't take it that way. It's brilliant. But, um, but that's, that's the idea that I think that would sell it as more copper. Um, flip ahead to, uh, to a couple other shots here too. The other thing that I think is cool that he's done that we should talk about is uh, he's stomping all over Eldar. So he's got some crumbling vestiges of Eldar civilization there where he's done some, some rich marbling into. Um, a I dead harlequin yeah there's a harlequin mask tucked in uh, I, I very much appreciate the marbling in the way that you've done it here um, very often I think of marble as having a lot of the same sort of directional fingers within it though um, so there's a couple of pieces that are sort of crossing in a direction that doesn't feel as natural for me um, so think about that a little bit with, when you're doing other marbling stuff, especially when it's crossing a larger surface like this one on the back. Of the two bits that he's standing on and the one in the front, you, you wouldn't really notice it as much. But uh, but same directionality with the, with the fingers and tendrils is maybe one thing to think about uh, to be more natural. Uh, what else do I want to say on here? Yeah, again, 
taking another look at the steel. He's got some steel bracings that go on the back of these guys' leg greaves. And he stayed along the same line with, uh, with the highlight point on the curvature of it. And that's reflected really well. It, even, even if you draw a line striking down from the, the forearm greave that's holding onto it, you can, you can actually almost draw the light straight down a line that goes across his left leg from his right arm. Um, so therefore maybe that couple of pieces on the backpack could use a little bit stronger highlight to draw that, that connection. Um, but again, these are minor composition things. One other thing I quite like, uh, and you talked about it earlier on another piece you were looking at is the idea of rotting bone where it starts bone color and goes to black as it goes to the end of the tuberal. Uh, I like that look and, and it's sold really nicely here and frames the backpack. So I don't have a lot of really bad things to say um, with my only, my only points of being about that, uh, that copper and, and selling the idea of, of beating copper a little bit better. Uh, so those are only two things. Uh, otherwise, very happy to see Nurgle done in this way and all the extra attention you've lavished on this thing to, to make that armor so very interesting and rich. Yeah, I agree. This is an absolutely fantastic piece. Like the level of detail is just astronomically wonderful. I, I love it. Um, yeah, it's great. Even down to like the banding on here. It's wonderful. Yeah. Little striations within there too. Mm hmm. Like it's just a it's just a fantastic execution on this guy. So yeah, well done, man. Talk about just dropping some style on us. I dig it. All right. Next up, let's see. Caspian has uh, his Lotan and some witch elves. I'll take those if you like, as I happen to be working on those witch girls, and I know Lotan. Uh, if you would like to take uh, Ranvig herself, now has a little flower knight, sure, uh, a beautiful miniature. All right, so Caspian. Um, so let's take a look here. I'm just going to kind of spin through these. He's got this, you know, this very like blue steel. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, yeah. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, just some items here. Um, first of all, on the base, he's going for, you know, these water bases because obviously he's going to be, you know, he's sort of merging these two with his deepkin. As you can see, he's got Lotan being the other guy. So, you know, these two different armies allied together, which is nice. Uh, I think that works fine. Um, the skin tone on these girls... Uh, is good i think you may want to smooth a little bit of it out uh in some places like i can see where we've got some wash that's sort of trapped here in some places things like that S like here around her neck you can see where it's kind of a little thick same here and here right so when we're if we're relayering over the top we want to make sure we smooth that out here we'll look at low tan with them uh with these girls in tow um Again, when we're doing the eyes on these girls, you want to make sure you have a nice dark ring around it, and you want to make sure the pupils... If, if you're going to do pupils, um, which is difficult on these models, kind of the easiest way to do it is to, to you know, just either draw them before you do the skin and just do a straight line kind of straight down in the middle of both, or push black into the edge, over like gray the whole eyeball, and then just push black into the edge of one of them. So they're all looking to, like, the left or the right. It can be one of the easiest ways to make it happen. It's It's tricky. On these girls, I just did a bunch of these. I know their eyeballs are really small. Um, so the main thing I would tell you here is I like the blue steel. Give me some shadows and some edges with it. Like what I mean by that is take something darker and still shade it in some places. Like we'll talk on low tan here because he's the easiest to see what I mean. Like up under this guy's crests in between here and here under the ridge of his helm you know have some darker areas take some darker color and shade under there 
then take some pure silver and edge it. Right? It's still going to read blue. Like, because it's absolutely still blue. But that will give you the natural contrast that you're really looking for there. Okay? Um, and help that to really pop out. Uh, you can do the same on all the girls and sort of like, you know, with their knives and with their helmets and things like that. It'll just help that kind of pop out. Okay? Uh, but yeah, overall, good stuff. Okay. You ready to talk about a flower night? Let's uh, flip in. Uh, we're ready to talk about some flower night. Indeed. Let's do it. I've seen this. I've seen this model done a fair bit. It's a actually, gorgeous because model. It's really an intriguing model throughout. Um, so obviously what, what she tackled in this one was doing this non-metallic gold, which is uh, something that I've been trying to work on a little bit more lately actually so this is right in my wheelhouse and uh and the current state of mind that i am trying to to figure out um so thinking about light catches and where it where it catches and where the deeps of the, of the shadow should be um is is the challenge of all, all this thing where she has hit it correctly is that she is certainly not lacking contrast and that's really important for striking this uh, this non-metallic gold and doing it right. So she's going a very deep brown into a virtually almost white bone color at the very highlights. So that is exactly right first off out of the gates. Um, so really when we're going to get nitpicky about things is where does the light strike, where does the highlight sit, and where should the deep shadows be? So from this perspective, we can see obviously that what she has chosen was high above the right shoulder is where the light is striking from because you can see that the right side of the body reflects most of the highlight and then the left side of the body and you and if you look just at the neck and below the head you can see that that's the spot where it's going to be in deep shadow um, when we get a couple tighter shots and she's got a couple frames ahead vince that shows that she's got a couple tighter tighter looks at the head itself and uh and the body uh, let's go one more that's the end is that it? oh i thought she had one of the face itself okay um when we get in tight and look at this kind of thing i think the only struggle that that you and i both have to work on because because i'm with you on this uh very much so uh, the, is is making this transition more smooth like, I think there's a couple spots when you get to your last highlight where it just comes on a little bit heavy. And maybe the frame back, when we look at it from the highlight side, will exhibit this a little bit better of what I'm talking about. Yeah, even on the back side here, I think that when you get tight and you look up on the shoulders here, she's made some good choices about where those should go and those highlights end up. Um, but but it just comes in a little bit, a little bit heavy. So doing some glazes with this in between with whatever you've chosen to be your mid-range color, I think is the answer. Uh, that's what's been working for me as I've been doing this thing here is I spend a lot of time going back and forth to, I have my, on my wet palette, I have my glaze that is always ready to go of that mid-tone color. And then whether I go to the shade or the highlight, I'm always doing another pass of a glaze in between. And that has helped me to avoid this kind of sharpness um, of, of contrast in there. So that's the overall challenge that I think that we need to, to work through. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on besides talking about the gold on here is because you have lavished so much attention on the gold, it makes me wonder, what about the sword? Is the sword metallic? Or is it stone? Because if it's metallic, then obviously we need to get in there and, and do the similar kind of practices on there. If you're imagining it as stone, then I guess, you know, do what you do. You've got some other colors of blues and greens that are working their way into that uh, as the vines overgrow it. Um, but for the composition as a whole, I, I just feel, I feel like it should be, I feel like it should be metallic as well to balance out against the rest. 
Um, the other thing I want to touch on really quickly, because you asked it in your um, in your text that you described this with, is you were wondering, should I have more flowers on the base and around this model? Um, so if you can spin us back out to uh, to an overall shot where we can see the base vents. Uh, I think the answer is yes. And I think it needs to be some purple flowers in truth um, because you do have a, a sprig of purple flowers in the back of this. And obviously that's the secondary color that you've used within this. So something violet uh, would certainly add to that base um, and then sort of close it out from, from top to bottom. Yeah, so there you go. Lots to work on. Uh, this is a tough technique. Uh, and I can tell you firsthand because I, I was at it just last night. You can try to work on some of this. So I'm with you. Let's yeah, get it, together. There you go. It, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, it is maybe one of the toughest, but I, I think it's rewarding for everybody to try, even if you're not going to tend to use non-metallic and say you're mainly an army painter. I think it's still very useful for all the reasons you just walked through. It really helps you like think about light placement. And light source, you know, a lot of miniature painting is just understanding how light works, right? And so even if you're not doing non-metallic metal, understanding where would the light fall and how would it fall and how would it interact with the object can really be a big help to, to doing any kind of painting, right? Not just non-metallic metal. So, and it's good practice for that sort of thing. Okay, cool. All right, next up, let's see. Uh, well, one of us is getting Stormcast here, buddy. Uh, so, <laughs> and by that, I mean, we're both getting Is it Stormcast. me? <laughs> uh, so, uh, why don't you take the new Lady Sequitur, the single model here from Sebastian, if you just want to, if you want to take that one. But I'll start by kicking off with Ryan Easterling. And uh, I'll, I'll take a look at his super fast uh, job here. So, he says this was sort of a speed paint for him. Um, he had a week because he was painting the starter set here. Um, um, you know, the deadline keeps you motivated. Uh, he'd like some feedback on a speed paint. Great. So I'm going to give this feedback from a speed paint perspective. Okay. And that's very much in the flavor of, of what I'm working on right now. So it's well-timed. Okay. So let's talk about speed painting. Now, speed painting with Stormcast is unusual because they're so metallic. And, like, admittedly, with metallic things, you're going to end up using slightly different tricks than you might in other uh, cases. Um, but most of these Stormcast here, I'm pretty sold on um, for a speed paint. I think the gold looks pretty good. Obviously, you don't go to great lengths with metal in speed paint. Metal, by its nature, does some of the work for you. And when you're speed painting, you just kind of... You just kind of let it do that work, and you say that's good enough. Um, as to the blue and, you know, the colors, um, the shoulders are a little bit flat. We might be able to pop some of the edges. You know, one of the great ways to get highlighting, uh, you know, more firmly sort of established when you're, when you're dealing with speed painting is to just do some strong edge highlighting, right? Um, some strong edges can, can do a lot of work. And so I feel like some of the blues and reds, you could go back in and sort of quickly, you know, edge that stuff out here, you know, maybe push a line here toward the soft edge, whatever. Um, but on the um, down here in this parts, the blue, red, the white. The next thing is I would never wash, don't wash cream with sepia. Like when people do this, the problem with this is it's so strong. Like you just get these, these marks here and it's, it's too strong of a shadow for it. That's the issue. Like, it doesn't need that strong of a shadow. If you're going to do this, thin the sepia out. Like, don't use the full strength stuff. Thin it out and just uh, apply a very light touch of it because the problem is it just overwhelms the native color of, of the white so much. And you got to go back and back out so much of it, right? You'd be a lot better off taking some of that sepia and actually just manually applying it. Like what I mean is just like take some of that CPM, mix it with some of your white and just instead of doing a wash, draw a thin glaze down, draw a thin glaze down, boom, 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 boom. boom. 
And that sounds slower until you realize now you don't have to go back over this and re-highlight it. I would just come back in and then edge the hot, the edge with white and done and done. Okay. So looking at that, the only other thing is when you got a guy with his helmet off amongst everybody who doesn't, you want to make sure you got some, some work in that face. So a little more detail in the face, a little more shadows, things like that for Mr. Ballastar crew there. But yeah, I mean, overall, for, for like a speed paint with a week, I think this was was very, like, it's very effective. Um, so I, I, you know, it's fine. Like, beyond that. that those are my other speed paint tips. There you go. Any thoughts from yourself? The thing I find, too, is when you're working and you're, and you're confining yourself to really just primary colors, I think that lends to doing speed paint, too. Blues and reds are probably the easiest to work with. Yeah, he de you definitely made the right color choices for this. No doubt about that. Okay. Now let's go to, from a speed-painted uh, force for the store, let's go to a single one. And it's Sebastian's first time painting something here. And uh, he said this was for his AOS2 release party competition. Cool. There must be a lot of that going on. Oh, it's it's a big launch, my friend. It's competition time. Indeed it is. Hey. Well, the thing that first strikes me with this is uh, richness of the red that you've done in here. And uh, we can really see the depth of the folds on that. So I think that's really brilliantly handled. Uh, I also want to give good compliments to the structure that you've put into the metallics here. So catching light points in the right places that we were just, I was just talking about in the past, um, right down the center of that foot, for example, and it kind of reads up. Um, if there's not a small knit, then maybe it might be that the highlight on that, uh, on that knee emblazon uh, is a little bit too broad comparatively to how it's come down there. Uh, so I appreciate that that's where a lot of light catches but it maybe is a little bit more broad than it could be. Um, not that it's bad, it's fine. Um, and then he's got a backside shot as well, right? Where I want to take a look at how he's handled doing black because that was his other predominant color on here. So I think that he's done this well enough without it appearing chalky when he goes into his highlight. Because of course, we've talked about black before. That's always the hardest thing to do is to get highlights on here without it being chalky. Um, so although I would say that there are some spaces where you could push it to a little bit more of a lighter color on some sharper edges of the fold, uh, I think that you've handled it pretty fine here. So I, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. Um, this is also a good spot where we can see that on the metallic, you've really struck a heavy highlight on the top side of that hammer. Um, but just like on that kneecap on the front, I think we can come a little bit darker on that on the lower facing side of it to, to get a bit of a greater strike of contrast. Does he have a side shot as well of the shield? Cause I, as I know that he's done some kind of interesting quartering on that one. There we go. That's what we want to see. All right. So with the quartering on this one, uh, it's a very cool idea that he's kind of come through, but it's all, and then he's counteracted with, with his primary color red. Um, now the question is, how do we get the same kind of depth of color that you've done on the folds of the cloth into the other places where red appears here? So it's not just on this shield, but also on the, the top knot that's coming off of the helmet as well is another spot that the red just doesn't appear as rich. And I think you have to force that to happen in this case, Sebastian. So for instance, if we look at this little lightning bolt, it's a small feature, but it still has an opportunity for you to leave a little bit of a uh, of... So for instance, um, if you can think of it that way, it's right where the, if, if I can describe this without you being able to see what I'm doing, if I look at this lightning bolt on the left side is its leading side, and then it comes down and makes its jag point, and then leads down the, the left again. 
if you can think of that left side as your highlight point and leave the stuff moving to the right as, as a darker point, and then just catch only the top side of the lightning bolt on the back end on the right side where it does its jag movement, then I think that you have some more dynamism, dynamism within that. So that's something to think about is you can actually force things to happen on an otherwise not changing surface. You can still force that on a, on a flat surface by doing that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, you kind of did it with the metallics on your hammer here. Uh, that's still on the shield, right? Like there's a couple of breaks to it, but you've still managed to to put some highlights in places where that would naturally be. Um, okay, let's go back to the front for a second because last thing I want to talk about is the mask on this lady, which is just super flat white. Um, I think you can still work some ivory into this porcelain to give a little bit of shadow and give more shape to the face. And the tabard that comes down underneath her and across her torso could also use a little bit in there. Uh, Vince, you just talked about uh, going too heavy with a, with a sepia wash. Um, but I think that working in some kind of linen color is really nice to do here. Um, but I actually might encourage you, if you were to do this, to do it in... A sort of a blue gray because you've got some very cold surfaces throughout the most part of it and I think you can do white in a couple of ways you can go warm thinking of it as linen and using sepia or or ivory or light brown or you can do it as a cold one which is doing into going into grayscale and it feels more cold and I think that's the way to go for the composition of this one so using a very very pale or maybe even bluish gray uh, to do the folds in there uh, might be the winner in this case. And it'll match up nicely with the kind of bluish tones that you got on the base too. So yeah, there's my thoughts on that. The winner is uh, the skills that you've done on the front here, that red tabard again, and the choices of where you've put your highlights for the metallic. Uh, just push contrast in those metallics on a couple other places and see so you can find contrast in the red in a few other places too. Those are my thoughts. Right on. It's a cool color scheme. I, I dig it. All right. Let's see. Got a few left. Okay. So, um, all right. You are well, the master of the Lord of Change. Are you going to tell us about Jody's? I would love to talk about yeah. Jody's. So why don't I take Jody's chicken? Yeah. Uh, and if you want to take the, the fire dwarf here. Mm-hmm. Mr. Fire Slayer. All right, so let's start with the Lord of Change. He says it's first time posting in the PMP and his first time painting a model this big, his Blue Magical Chicken. He's been back in the hobby for about a year after dipping in and out over the last 20. Um, never got past the base coat wash dry brush approach until the last 12 months when he started researching how to improve his painting and deliberately practicing. Okay, cool. Well, this is certainly an intimidating model. That is absolutely true. This thing is big. And you have you have gone the distance, my friend. He's going the distance. Uh, okay. So, first things first. Yeah. I mean, let's just talk about overall impressions. Uh, overall impression. I like it quite a bit. Uh, it's, you've done a lot of great detail here. You've got a pretty nice color balance going on around the thing on, on a very difficult model to color balance, by the way. Um, I like your transitions. You got some nice green here and up here on the flame and here and on this side of the wing. So it's rather framed well. Um, the probably the area, the, the color that's a little too much in power here is this red. This tabard is such a pain in the butt. Because there is no, like, I, I, I feel your pain here. I had to redo this thing like three times on my chicken to find a color that actually I thought fit. Um, but the problem with this red is that you don't have any of the other red really. I mean, it's his mouth, but like, that's pretty much it. So if you wanted to, you could cheat and bring this up here onto this armor piece that's weirdly sitting on his back. 
like I understand you're going blue armor, but who cares? Like this piece can be red and that's fine. Um, it doesn't have to be the same armor. It can be a different sort of thing. And then that will help balance it out. You could also make these scales up here in his like little zinch shape staff that red. So that's my only thoughts on color balance. I feel like that's the only part where there's a challenge there. Now, let me talk about just some quick other items. The wing transitions look quite nice. Um, what I will say is that with these hashes in, you want to get them a little thinner. So I would go to my video on sharp, thin lines, which is basically going to talk to you about flow aid and stuff like that, um, because you want to make sure these stay like real razor thin. Um, but they're good. Like that's a good instinct. And you put in the work here. Like it looks nice. But when I get close, I can see the the thickness of the hashes. We want to keep we want to keep feather lines like real sharp. OK. Um. Overall, like the places where I can see there are some challenges are with colors that have challenging highlights. So for example, the purple where your highlights are very stark. And that's because purple is naturally quite stark when you highlight it. The trick, as we've said before on the show, is when you get to purple, use a little flesh tone instead of using a lighter color purple or white mixing white into your purple or anything like that. That will keep it much um That'll keep it much smoother and give you a softer purple transition, much easier to manage then, okay? Um, my other thought here is just one more, uh, which is down here on these crystals. I assume you're going for blue glow. The problem is it looks like these things were blue ice cream that melted. So glow should not be as strong or opaque as the thing that is making the light. Um, I appreciate, I, I like the effort. It looks good. It sets a nice scene. By the way, good use of the Azurite Ruin scenery there too. I dig the little base you built here. Um, but this, it looks like this, it is the same intensity and opacity as the crystal itself. Light doesn't work like that. Okay. Um, like, Think of a light on a on a white ceiling when it is plugged in and exposed. You don't get a circle of exactly the light around it, right? What happens is it diffuses slowly. And also, by the by, there's usually a slight shadow very near it. So what you want to do here is a very light glaze of this sort of color and thin it out to nothing to show that light falling away. Okay. And you don't want to pick your brightest color. Your brightest color should be the crystal. You want to pick something more in the middle here, just slightly darker than your brightest blue and fade that out. Okay. But overall, this is a really good job. Your gold is handled well. Your skin is handled well. Your colors are fantastic and very eye catching. The base is very flavorful, looks very zinchy. Um, I like all the highlights on like the claws and the tongue and all of that stuff. So you did a lot of good work here, man. You should be very proud of this. If this is your first big model, first off, congratulations. I This guy is a slog, but you did a wonderful job and uh, it's something to be proud of and get into it. I love big models. If I could, I would seriously just paint armies of monsters. <laughs> so I'd never paint 30 troops again. It'd just be monsters from here on out. You can do that, can't you? Isn't that allowed? Yeah, you can, actually. Oh. There's plenty of armies that don't. That's why, yes, I play plenty of armies that don't have those troops. But sometimes I fall in love with an army that also wants me to paint a lot of troops. You know what I mean? So what do you yeah. do? We can't help what we fall in love with, Kieran. You know? All right. Such is life. Such is life. All right, let's talk about, uh, speaking of an army that requires a lot of bodies that I'm definitely not in love with, let's talk about Fire Slayers. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get a look at this. This is a feast for the eye um, in, in a lot of ways, uh, most, mostly good ways. But uh, what, he, what he expressed in here is that he has done a lot with, with fire source and, and, and some light sourcing. So when you see this from a distance... And we'll see a little bit more when we uh, when we get into some other shots here. But he has, even in this shot, three predominant light sources. 
One of them appears to be the gullet and the mouth of the magma droth itself. There's the brazier that's just behind the dwarf. And then there's the dwarf itself appears to be emanating light both front and back from the dwarf itself. When we move ahead in a, in a couple of frames and we get a look at the base, you can also see that the base itself, there is lava down there and that's emanating light and it's casting up upon the forefoot uh, and the underside of this magma droth too. Okay, so let's talk about this. So first off, the instincts in some ways are really good in that to sell the idea of hot, fiery fire, we have to have darkness and shadow, right? So by going into this sort of brimstone dark color on the back of this Magandroth is what makes most of this work, right? If that was a brighter red or a more rich red, then I think it wouldn't work as well. But I'm okay with that because you chosen that. When we do the hard scales around the mouth and the shoulders as well and down the legs, that's what makes this all work in the first place. So, so very well done. Now, from this angle, we can say that the magma dross mouth is in fact the hottest point, and we get a little bit of exposed stuff down the throat as well. Uh, and I and I get the impression that the source of it is in his underbelly, that would be between his two forelegs. Uh, so, so that's very cool. That works well. As it emanates out. And we get to this brazier up here. No, you can go back to that frame because we'll move on to that. So this brazier up here is obviously a big hot spot. So that's all yellow. Um, and the tendrils fall away and it gets a little bit more red as it drifts, drifts away from it. Now that appears to be casting light on the back of the dwarf. Um, however, it doesn't appear to be casting much light backwards. So to back out a little bit to the other frame that you were just at a second ago, um, only a little bit of that light cast backwards, right? But there's, but it's it's flowing down, but it isn't catching. When you get a tighter look at that, uh, I guess that sconce that's that's framing the last bit of you know the higher the higher rising flame. There's no light casting down on the inside of that, so I think that is a bit of a miss. Um, the thing that I want to talk about, though, that's a bit confusing to me is let's get a look at the dwarf itself. He's got a frame where he's, where he's really tight on the dwarf. And this is where all the confusion happens to me, actually, Edwin, is I think this, this guy is casting light backwards upon that pickaxe piece or whatever that, whatever that decorative bit is on the, uh, on the sconce. But he's also casting light forward onto his, onto his saddle frame and then down onto the base of his saddle that he's standing on too. Um, and I think this is the whole point of a little bit too much extra confusion when you look at the composition of the model as a whole. Uh, I mean, maybe there's some, some backstory that you have that, that goes on where this this Dwarven Fire Slayer leader is, in fact, emanating light, and he is fire incarnate. Um, but it just adds too many confusing sources of light on, on a model, especially these two sources that are so very close together. Uh, and, that's, and that's the confusion for me when we do that overall. So this is conjecture, of course, on my part. But if, if I was to do that again, I think that's the one source that, that, that doesn't emanate light. I think you need to... That would that would back off. A um, couple of other little bits just to touch on while we're at it is you have sort of two different styles of doing these spines that are coming off of the dragon, the magma droth itself. So the spines that go across the back, they have stayed just red and fairly dark, but the ones that are coming off of the legs um, sort of go the opposite direction of how we'd normally do fire and flame. Um, and what I mean by that is normally the, the source of it, the root of it, is, is the lightest color and then goes away dark as we, as we step away from it. So that's the other little bit of confusion for me, but in some ways, I'm sort of okay with it. 
um, because it frames that a little bit better. So, so I guess what I'm saying is, although my mind tells me that it's wrong, it might be all right. <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying there. Um, yeah. So I guess overall, I, I think this is a big mammoth project that you've undertaken. Um, really great for you to experiment with these different light sources and how they cast. Um, but when you have so many sources, I think that adds confusion and it's harder to, it's harder to nail the other ones when you have overlapping light sources that are competing for a highlight and a shadow effect in the same places. Um, so I think I narrow down your light sources uh, in the end is my conclusion to, to look at this over. You got any thoughts you'd like to add before moving on, Vince? Nope, I agree. Yeah, it's the kind of thing where you can just get a little too busy. I think that might be a line we cross there, right? But yeah, it's a super cool idea. All right, let's see. Andrew Bashford, uh, first model he's painted after 20 years. Awesome. Holy Welcome back. Absolutely. All right, so, and he says it was all painted with cheap paints and stuff like that, so we'll get into that. Uh, let's see, and then... Uh, so why don't I'll take that one and kind of talk some initial stuff. If you want to do the other dual piece here from Aaron Daly, and then we'll finish out on, we'll talk together about bleep bloops archon. We'll just review it. We'll, we'll, we'll admire it together to finish out the month. Sound good. Sure thing. Okay. So first of all, Andrew, welcome back. Um, okay. So let's talk about stuff here. I'm trying to get like an angle where I can really see everything. Okay. All right. Well, that'll have to do. Okay. So all in all for using like, you know, cheaper paints. Um, yeah, it's nice. Like you can tell cheaper paints have a sort of texture and they're very satin. They have a, you know, gloss to them. There's lots of things that like miniature paints are going to do better, but I completely empathize with your like, Hey, this is, was, you know, I wanted to get back into it and, and give it a shot. Well, Awesome. Welcome back. Um, and I'm glad to hear you're already enjoying yourself. So uh, far be it for me to ruin you enjoying yourself, because I think for a fun experiment here with this bird, I think he looks pretty cool. Um, you've got some nice colors there. You know, you're messing with like water effects on and the rocks and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, there's little things. So, so I'm trying to think of exactly what is going to be the best advice for you at this stage of where you're at. My first thought is it's probably worth it to find like a cheaper set of say Vallejo or army painter or something like that and experiment with that. You're going to have very different sort of results than with the craft paints. That's personal opinion. Um, it's just probably a good thing to do. Now, as far as with this individual model, um, the, you know, when I look at this, you've got some nice color execution. I like that. I like the shading in the wings. Um, I think that works really well. I think you captured that well. Um, the feathers have this nice transition. I think one of the things we could do is we could probably push the haunch um, a little more. So what I mean by that is like up here, we could have a little highlight. Same here. You know, maybe on these individual little brown sort of... Uh, I guess they're brown feathers or whatever. Something there. I don't have any problem with the color choices. I think they're actually rather nice. The purple sets off well against the brown. Um, so I think that's good. Um, as to him landing on like these rocks, uh, you know, my thought with that is uh, a rock that is sitting in water is green. Like it's not, I don't mean completely. I just mean like it has green on it because this has life growing on it. Right, like a yellow sandstone rock sitting in water is either going to be very dark brown or like have moss and organic matter growing up all over it. And you got a good transition because like you made it darker down here. It's so, like you've got a lot of really good instincts here. Um, but I would work some some very subtle green browns up into the base here as well. Not enough to distract, but it would also help set off this purple a little. You know, green is a complementary color to purple. It's very subtle. You know, do a strong green. I'm not telling you to, like, paint this, 
you know, bright green or something. I just mean like a very green brown, something like an Ethonian camo shade, which by the way, would be the other element I would recommend if you're going to pick up some paints is to definitely pick up like some, the GW basic shade set, pick up like a Nuln Oil, an Agrax, a Seraphim Sepia and an Ethonian camo shade, black, dark brown, light brown and green brown. And you will have most of the shades you need for a lot of your projects. Um, finally, with the beak and these claws, I feel like they might get a little too hot, a little too quick. Um, a thin orange glaze over the top of that to sort of bring that yellow back into line might make sense. But this is all like, and, and the reason I hesitate around some of this is because, again, this is your first mini, and this is actually really, really good <laughs> for your first mini in 20 years. Like, I want to be very clear about it. Is there lots of things you could do? Sure but I would hope you would expect that. That is to say, you didn't come back and paint the perfect mini after being away for 20 years. I hope that's not what your expectations are. Um, but this is really good for being away for that long. And you're doing a lot of really good things. So those are some things I would encourage you to experiment with. If you're talking about like cheap figs and setups and stuff, um, obviously if you've got some paints, you know, uh, Hobby Lobby sells Vallejo paint and you can use like a 40% off coupon there every day. So uh, like my co-host Tom would literally like he had a Hobby Lobby in between his home and his work. So every day he would go in and buy one bottle of paint for like 40% off. So he got them all for like a dollar something. And after like a month, he had all the paint he wanted. So, you know, just a thought if that's in your area or available. But anyways, um, Overall, you know, you can keep playing around with this. Think of like bones figures and stuff. Those are good buys, um, you know, super cheap. Um, if you can get like people reselling board game minis and stuff, lots of good ways to get cheap figs. But it's cool, man. I, I, I hope to see more from you because this is a coming back strong. Yeah, it's good out of the gates. Absolutely. All right. Another first time PMP post. My goodness. And now we've got Aaron Daly. All right, so this is uh, another one for yeah. I just saw it quickly. More GW store duel, yeah, duel competitions. This is a so, nice uh, chaos showdown. Yeah, you know what? It, it, at first glance, it's to me, it's like these are the two war queens deciding who the real war queen is. Uh, and I is the it. tagline of the new Age of Sigmar "Let the blood flow"? Is that the new tagline? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Because, because, because that's what Aaron's trying to tell us. <laughs> he he seems to be selling that as his thing, but no, it's it's yeah, it's. I think in his mind, in sorry, in the mind of these two characters, you bet that's what the new tagline is. You're right. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, well, I want to talk about composition overall first of all, and that is that the two models that he's chosen here, and even just the poses of them are almost mirrors of one another, right? So they each have axe-wielding right arm and leading left arm um, striding into one another with the same leg raised. So it's so very mirror that, that I'm, I'm really kind of enthralled by the fact that there's two models that share different aesthetics, but yet are acting in the same way. So that's a great choice, first of all. Uh, second thing, and this is kind of harkening back to what you were saying about the other duel that you looked at earlier, is we don't have too much crossover of color between the two, so you know who's on what side. When you try to think of, you know, the classic blue versus red matchups, um, you know who the enemy is and or, or who the bad guy and the good guy is at a first glance here. Um, but that leads me to one thing that might have been a subtle change, and that is the inner side of... Uh, Stormcast Girl's Cloak. And I'm sorry, I don't know the name if she has a name. Um, she was originally where... Neve Black Talon, but I believe he's using her as a Chaos Warlord now. So, but yes. Yeah. So that red on the inside of the cloak is the only thing that really crosses over between the two. Um, and I think that that maybe could have been a different choice. Could have been, uh, could have been maybe just an ivory color, um, something neutral, or or even just a even just a brown. You know, a tannish brown would have been fine underneath there. So that's that's the only 
conjecture I have about color choice on these things. Uh, I think the execution of the paint is really good. Uh, let's flip ahead in a couple of frames. Um, I think the, the way that you've done the light highlighting on Knave's armor uh, really comes out nicely. You know, where he's picked out and chosen to do the highlights on that purple. I really quite like, and that's executed well. Um, I think that on the red that we've done on the cloak of this war queen, the depth of that could have been sold a little bit more. Um, you've kind of done it on the shield, like on the shield of the war queen. If we can find a snapshot of that for the folks, um, that transitions pretty nicely around the runes. Um, but but on the cloak itself in the back, like when we get a back shot of her, I think that that could have been pushed a little bit further. You get more contrast in that. You have one deep fold, but there's a few other folds that are just absent of of that, in, at least in the way of photographs here. Um, now, the other thing that I would say as something to to work on is the flesh tone on, on especially this working. She, she's obviously got more flesh exposed than the nave because she's just only got her head poking out. But we can find a shot of the front side of this war queen. I think that uh, there's a, some exposed spots here where, again, it's a little bit overblown by light, but I get the sense that, like when we look at the, at the hand that's holding this ax, uh, there should be some more depth into there. We can probably work in a little bit of color shadowing underneath the lower part of her face, and then uh, and then the the upper and inside of her thigh where there's a hint of a bit of a shadow. I think that that is an opportunity to push that contrast and and add a little bit more life in that space. Um, beyond that, the other thing that always strikes me when we're doing, you know, blood blood everywhere is the idea that it's not always super bright red um, because blood dries. I don't know what, how, what the rate of flow of this blood river is right here, but in some spaces where you've washed out over the stone, it has by nature, because of what you've painted it on top of, looked a little bit darker. Um, but I think that in the end, there's some spaces where as we get further away from this blood flow, that it could be even darker still uh, and works in a little bit of tincture of some browns into that kind of stuff too. On the blades themselves, uh, and we got a couple of couple of shots of those, that turns out okay. I mean, obviously that's meant to be fresh blood, so that can be your brighter, your brighter spots. So so that part's okay. But the stuff that's flowing away, uh, like we look at the wall behind the nave herself. It's, it feels like it's a little bit brighter than it should be. Um, and I think when we talk about that in relation to composition, uh, I think if that stuff is even darker, it brings your focus back to the center even more because that's still the brighter spot. Uh, and, that, and that's actually the where I want to finish my compliment. I think that this chaos star that you've done in the super bright red still maintains the focal point. So when you look back and forth between these two models, you still come back to center. Um, so uh, a couple of technique things, uh, I suppose, the, that I would uh, come back to and remind you about. So, so the red with depth of color and working out some darker spots on reds. Um, come back to maybe that choice of, of keeping red off of nave so that you have two diametrically opposite combatants a little bit more and no crossover in between of them is my other thought. Um, but as far as composition, and I don't want to come back to what I said at the opening of this, is your choice of models and the way that they're opposed against one another is really brilliant here, Aaron. And I think that you've, you've struck gold with that idea and the whole scene in itself and the way that you've composed it. So well done. I hope this ends up being a winner. Yeah, it's cool stuff. I love the use of like Nave fall into chaos. She looks pretty great as that, uh, as that sort of chaos war queen, like that's fa pretty fantastic. So good stuff, man. You have to keep us in the loop on how it all turns out. All right. 
last one of the month. Uh, so this is his finisher, Magnetized Archon the Black. If you remember this, you remember when he did, uh, what's his name? The Manfred, the yep. ruiner of everything. Um, obviously, that's a, you know, that's a, that kit. You could have multiple writers on it, you know, Neferata, Archon, or, or Manfred. I'm glad to see you have went from the worst Mortark to the best, uh, to Archon. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, like, again, as always, Bleep Bloop has a very distinct style. He runs across these massive transitions in these, you know, big, big, big non-metallic uh, runs up and down. And all that looks really fantastic. Um, some of your magenta here, Bleep, isn't quite as smooth as some of the other stuff. Um, so, like, here... Your white spots are a little harsh. Um, same here. Whereas like with Manfred, a lot of those were were just a, a hair smoother. So you may want to go in and just kind of fuzz this just a little. Like I understand this is your light catch, but like a little bit of you know, softer white purple right here and here, here are white magenta, I should say. Um, sticks out as being apropos. Um, same with down here on the edge, same with here. Just a few little places like that that kind of stand out to me as being um, a little less than than as smooth as they could should be. So, yeah, just you're just saying is it, to me, it looks like those couple spots come in a little bit hot. Because um, again, when we think about where is the light emanating from, to me, it reads like it's actually coming directly from his right not above or below but almost like directly on right like if you imagine it was from the tip of his his whatever spectral cape trail right about that level and coming straight across so that far side of his torso i don't think should be where the hottest light hits so i think i'm with you on that um yeah, the rest of that seems okay. I don't know. I, I'm in that zone right now. I'm, I'm I'm the student of light as well, so I'm trying to figure out where the light source comes from and where it should end up. So <laughs> it's a great challenge for all of us, more or less every time we paint. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, overall, it's good stuff, man. Bleep. As, you, as usual, I say it every time and I mean it every time. Any month with a bleep bloop submission is a good month in my book. So I appreciate you sharing another awesome one with us for inspiration, buddy. Yeah. All well, right. Thankfully, he just got it in right at the end of the month, too. He did. He, he snuck it right in on us. Just made it. All right. So that's... I'm going to ask you before you ask me. What's, what's your pick of the month? <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> you got me you got me i was i was uh i was going to go immediately to be like so kieran <laughs> what's yeah, your I favorite played this game before i know how it goes <laughs> uh no so i do have an answer i am going to scan back from it because it was actually uh from the beginning of the month oh where are you at oh, boop boop there he is went right past him um I'm going to go for a random mini painter uh, and his empire guy on foot. Uh, I really mm -hmm. loved it. Uh, I thought it was great. It's such a simple miniature, but he brought it to life in a lot of interesting ways. Um, had some good color transition, good freehand on the cape. The skin tones were fun. The sword reflections were nice. Uh, yeah, I really, I really dug it. I mean, obvious shout out to uh, Mickey for uh, that incredible base, but I'm not giving her any credit until she puts the mini on top. And if I could, my, my, my also like, I don't know, my other pick, I'm picking two. I don't care. There's no rules to this fulcrum and that incredible clan Escher conversion for that. We just reviewed like the one that's made to look like yeah. a Mandalorian. Yeah. Love it. Great stuff. Great free hand. Beautiful. All right. Your choice. Well, my choice is going to go with, uh, with Tebow's uh, Nurgle boss. Oh yeah. That typhus. Because all the extra stuff that he lavished onto the armor to, to put those cracks in there and add that extra detail. Um, 
that was a mammoth effort to, to bring that together. Um, and then just because, you know, I talked about it a lot this month because I'm experimenting it with it myself, but doing that metallic and, and light capture and understanding where it's coming from. Uh, he showed me some really good mastery of that on that piece. So that's why I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, Hey, if I can say a Nurgle model blew me away, one, that means it's not a demon model. I think we all know that. And, uh, and two, it means that, uh, you did something really special and this Nurgle model blew me away. So it's, it was great. Totally agree. Yep. All right. So that brings us to the end of the PMP review, which leads to me saying the following things as always. Thank you to everybody who submitted, but thank you more to everybody who commented, who shared feedback, who answered questions, who was there giving answers, positive critiques, help, assistance on every post all the time. This community is wonderful because all of you. I'm happy to do this thing every month, but it is you out there making those comments that makes this community great. So please, please, please keep that up. Be active, participate. When you see that post come into your email or you see a new post you like or whatever, or however you find it, take the five seconds, give some positive feedback. You can make someone's day and keep somebody painting and help them in their own personal hobby journey, just as they should do the same for you. Um, yeah, so please keep it up. Gear? I, I want to reinforce to that 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 is the greatest source. Um, paint many, many things each month, everybody. Paint, paint as much as you're able to. Um, there was a comment earlier of somebody that says they were dedicating themselves to painting an hour a day. Uh, if you can do that, that is, that is brilliant. You're going to, you're going to excel at such a rapid rate by, by doing that repetition. Um, but then at the end of the month, the thing that you're most proud of, submit that to us in your text. When you write that and you put that post into the end of the month, submit section, give us a couple questions, point at a couple of particular things that you want us to drill down to. And we'll do our very best to, to give you our feedback on, on exactly that. Absolutely. Yep. Help us help you with some focused feedback by you telling us exactly what you want us to comment on. Um, and, you know, as usual, try to only post these in the, in the end of month review, those things you're really proud of, or those things you have direct questions on that kind of stuff. So we can spend the most time giving you the feedback you need. So, um, uh, but uh, please submit everything to finish projects if you're not putting in an end of month review. So that way everybody can comment on it as well. Um, and certainly people comment on, you know, on end of month review, but so we can afford the maximum time, which I think this month was just about right. Uh, I am so excited about all the new people posting. I hope that keeps up. So thank you to everybody new. That's fantastic. If you want to join us on your hobby journey, why just look right down there in the description. It's the link to the PMP. Click that and join up. We'd love to have you along on your hobby journey, whether you're just a newbie starting out or maybe coming back to your first mini after 20 years or maybe a long time master. Whatever the case, we would love to have you. Uh, any other final thoughts before we uh, close out there, Kieran? No, I just hope that it keeps up with the heat of summer. Now, now we're going to step into July. Um, usually people go outside more, but hopefully they still find time to paint. <laughs> what is this outside you speak of all right so at any rate thank you to everybody as always kieran thank you sir for joining me again for the review and as always we'll see you next month good night <laughs>